my stuff popping up. Um, we are officially 23 members, right? 23 I members of the task force. I, I thought we were 22 for a while until uh, Donovan right. joined. Yes. All right, we're at seven. <laughs> Well, let's somebody join more time. The name's not familiar. Senator Morrison will not be able to attend today either. Okay. Uh, and just an announcement. This is Stacy Shogren. I uh, help facilitate the meetings today. If you are watching us on uh, YouTube stream, know that we're just giving it a little more time for uh, members to come in to make sure we've got a quorum day after holiday, maybe messing things up a little bit. So be patient with us and we'll start as soon as we are able. Um, Jess, you said who, who just responded in that they couldn't be here? Senator Morrison. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'm counting nine, Jessica, is that what you're counting? Yes. I also want to say hello, Shane Pennington. Thanks for joining us. Hey there. Thanks for having me. Good morning, Helen. Hi. I'm going to find my little volume thingy. I don't know if I'm on <laughs> You are, you're on, you're on. Well, you know, it's always getting it the right size so you can mute and do all that stuff. So I know. Just working it out. You Gone know. are the days of just kind of showing up and having everything. All you have to worry about is a piece of paper and pen. I think I'm going to go out and come back in because I think I'm uh, erroneously on the YouTube. So I'm going to quickly do that because it's it appears to be. You're gonna go out and come back in. Yes. Oh, well, well, I'm gonna make sure. Yep, that's just fine. Okay. All righty. Something. Well, now it showed up, so I don't know. Well, we, huh. We'll just do it. All right. And members, if you go ahead and hop on to mural, that'd be terrific. Uh, you can see Jess is sharing her screen right now, uh, but you'll want to be on, on your own. And Jessica, I think we have quorum. We do. Does that match with your counting? All right. Yeah. Well, excellent. All right. Well then, unless I hear anything from the rest of our support team, that they need us to wait. That would be just with issues with the streaming or uh, anything else. Nick, if you in the actual physical room need to deal with anything, speak up now and I'll wait. Otherwise we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. Who's our member Jessica? in person? Uh, we do not, well, that's a long story, but we don't need one. We've checked in again with uh, data practices and open meeting law staff uh, early last week, and they gave us the go ahead to just make sure that somebody from, uh, I can't remember the actual word they used, the organization was present. So Nick is on site. All of the open meeting stuff is posted and media is working just fine in the room. So we should be go good to go that way. Um, but thanks to Jeremy, who was ready to be the person on the spot. Uh, okay, Jessica, are we ready to go? Yes, we are. Thank you. All right, let's do it. Uh, okay, so welcome, everyone. Uh, cameras are on. A life is good. Uh, just want you to know that if you are looking for the Psychedelic Medicine Task Force meeting, this is the right spot. So whew, yay for that. Uh, just a couple housekeeping bits of information that we share with members, and in a moment I'll share with anybody that might be watching. Uh, members, uh, always good if you are comfortable and able to keep your cameras on when we're, especially when we're having a discussion. 
um, get that there's technology and other issues that might prohibit that for you, but when you can default to cameras on, that's helpful. Uh, also, we try to use the raise your hand feature uh, and either Jessica or I will team, tee up uh, speaking orders uh, so we don't have, I don't know what, verbal traffic jams. Um, we are not using the chat feature uh, unless uh, there is some technical issue uh, that you need to communicate to your support team. Why? Because those that are watching on uh, um, YouTube can't see it, so it's just uh, harder. It's also harder to have conversation when it's going in two different directions at one time. So our default is to not use the chat unless it's technical stuff. Um, do make sure you get on to Mural. Uh, the, uh, uh, password and all that information is in the email that you received uh, prior to this meeting, if it's not already in your um, search bar. Uh, so you're set to go that way. And um, just a reminder on the screen right now that um, our Jess is sharing uh, staff and support that's involved in helping you do your work, include Dana Farley, uh, Dr. Carolyn Johnson from MDH, uh, Jessica Nielsen, Dr. Jessica Nielsen is our chairperson, and then MAD staff include Jess Burke, uh, who's usually running the controls, Nick Kaur, who is in that physical space that I just mentioned, and me. Uh, meetings are mostly uh, Jessica and I kind of tag teaming, uh, uh, facilitating the conversation. In fact, I think today you'll probably hear from Jessica more than Server. Thanks. Uh, thanks for your interest in the work of this task force. We appreciate it. Uh, know that the meetings are not recorded. Minutes are, however, uh, posted on the task force website, uh, along with other meeting materials. The information on how to find that is here. I know you can't click on it. No matter how hard you might try, you can't click on it. Easiest thing, though, is to go to uh, MDH's website and just do a search, and that'll get you to wherever you need to go. Um, and I'm just checking if Dana's here. He's not. Dana was going to give an update on a request to record these meetings. He sent us a message just prior to start that he's hung up with an appointment. So when he does get here, uh, we'll turn it over to him uh, to, to share with you what he's been learning about meeting recordings. So I will um, hold off on that. And that brings me to Jessica. No, wrong one, Jess, who is gonna give an announcement. Oh, so somebody has their mic on. I think it's Ari. Ari, if you can mute yourself, that'd be great. Sorry about that, Dunn. Thank you, no worries. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to our Jess, Jess Burke, who has an announcement on um, a Teams channel that we set up for you. Jess? Thanks, Stacey. Uh, so um, some of you uh, have, we were using Google Drive to store all of our documents. <clears throat> uh, some state folks had issues with that. Um, so we set up a Teams channel that allows um, external um, non-state folks to access it. Um, we've tested it out with a few non-state folks. Thank you all for helping. And it seems to be working. So probably later today, you'll get, um, I'll send out the invitation to the wider group. Um, it's It should be arranged mostly the same as the Google Drive. Um, that's where we'll kind of keep, um, you know, our report development, keep work group notes. Um, and I'm sure some of you are going to have trouble accessing it, and I can work with you on that. So um, just be on the lookout. We will um, we will be moving from Google Drive to Teams, um, and that still allows uh, like multiple people to be working in documents when we get to that stage of um, task force work. Thanks. Fair enough. Anybody have any immediate questions on that switch of platforms for, for just? All right then. Uh,
It seems like you might be frozen, Stacy. Can you hear us? Am I really? Yeah, I can hear you. And I was wondering if it was me or I was hoping it might be somebody else. So I'm going to disconnect to VPN. I think for now, Jess, I could probably walk through the um, the task force charge. Absolutely. All right. So I'm back. I'm back. Okay. I'm back. Did it work? Yes. Okay. Go ahead and take over. All right. Good. Uh, it's going to be one of those days, everyone. Um, okay. So just a reminder of the legislative charge for this task force. Uh, you were established to advise the legislature on the legal, medical, and policy issues associated with the legalization of psychedelic medicine in the state. Um, uh, for the purpose of this, purposes of this work, psychedelic medicine means MDMA, psilocybin, and LSD. On the next couple slides, you see more specifics about uh, the actual charge. Jessica, if you could move the slide over one more time or two more times so they can see both of the next slides. Scooch a little bit more. There's the scientific research and then the duties. Um, so if you could scan through both of those, maybe slowly. Um, you all have seen this many times. I'm going to um, take the opportunity to choose not to read through all of the details. Okay, um, Jessica, are you ready to take over? And well, we've got to do some business first. So let's work together on this one, shall we? Um, we've got some business, uh, uh, just standard stuff here. If you're ready, Jessica, and you've been keeping an eye on the participant list, I can do roll call if that seems to make sense to you. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks, Stacey. Um, so yeah, we're going to take oh, okay. care of some business. And I just want to thank um, all the members for attending today. I know it's April Fool's Day, um, but thank you for uh, not joking, everyone. Um, and also, uh, thank <laughs> you to all the observers on YouTube. Uh, we're really um, happy to have you uh, watching our proceedings today. And so we just need to take care of some logistical uh, business first before we get started into the meat of the task force meeting. So uh, first, we need to do a roll call uh, just to confirm attendance of our members and confirm our quorum. Uh, so I'm going to turn it back over to Stacy real quick to do a roll Call. Sounds good. And uh, know everybody that as soon as we're done with the roll call, we're going to go right into approving the minutes. So just keep your finger close to your, your um, mute button. And here we go. Courtney Amason, are you here? I'm here. My internet is not great. So I'm going to leave my camera off. Just step Sounds great. Helen, are you here? I'm here. Thank you. Guthrie is not able to be here. Send it to Julia, uh, Julia Coleman. Are you here? Julia? Okay. Uh, Paula DeSanto, are you here? Here. Very good, thank you. Jeremy Drucker. Present. And I will have Jeremy. to be off camera a little, off and on, so my apologies in advance. Thanks for letting us know, Jeremy. Uh, Stefan Egan, are you here? Here, uh, bad internet, I'll be off camera as well. Yeah, man, there, see that's where the April Fool stuff is coming in. It's like technology gremlins all over. Uh, Dr. Margaret Gavian, are you here? I'm here. Uh, Bennett Hartz? Here. Very good. David Hong? David? David is absent. Uh, Nick Lennertz. Yeah, I'm here. Ari McHenry. Ari? I'm here. I'm here also, uh, poor internet. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Senator Kelly Morrison is absent today. Dr. Jessica Nielsen. Here. Kit O'Neill. Here. Jill Phillips. Good morning. I'm here. Hi, Jill. Gotcha. Uh, uh, Representative Andy Smith is not here today. Uh, Michael Tabor. Good morning. Here. Good morning, Michael. Uh, Adam Tomzik. Here. Uh, Dr. Ranji Varghese. 
Here. Good morning. And Representative Nolan West. Nolan? Nolan is absent. All right. You are all worried about quorum. We're in good shape. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, turn it back over to you, Jessica, to call for um, a motion and second discussion and uh, vote on minutes from the March meeting. Yeah, thanks. So um, so next on our agenda is to approve our meeting minutes from March. Uh, so those were sent out um, a week ago for folks to review and um, determine whether any um, things need to be modified. Um, so we can open this up for discussion if there are any changes needed, um, assuming that all members have read the minutes. Um, so does anyone want to come on mic and, and offer any edits or modifications or clarifications to the meeting minutes from March? Donovan Sather is present. Stacy. Oh, did we not call you for oh, the roll call? Donovan Sather is present. Ojibwe representative. Thank you. Thank you, Donovan. Apologies. Got it. All right. So you're waiting for any changes to yeah. the minutes from the March meeting? Okay. Yeah. Does anybody have anything to add or edit? Hearing none. Okay, so now we're going to, um, hearing none, then the rules of order require us to do a roll call. So we'll need to do um, a roll call by a uh, vote by roll call. So do I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. A second. Okay, great. So I'll turn it over uh, to, have... to do the vote by roll okay. call. Okay, that went so fast. It was Adam that made the motion. Yep. And Helen that did and the who second. seconded. Helen? Very good. Thank you. All right. I'm gonna go fast through this, just first names. So here we go. Courtney. Yes. Helen. Yes. Guthrie. Oh, Guthrie's gone, sorry. Um Paula. Yes. Jeremy. Yes. Stefan. Stefan. I don't think Stefan was at the last meeting, so maybe it's an abstain. Okay. Uh, Margaret. Yes. Thank you. Bennett. Yes. David. Oh, David's absent. Uh, Nick. Uh, let's see. I'm off my groove here. Are you? Were you here? Um, I was here, and I approve. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jessica. Yes. Kit. Yes. Jill? Yes. Michael? Yes. Adam? Yes. Ranji? I can't remember whether I missed that last meeting. You were absent. Yeah, so abstain. OK. And Donovan? Yes. All right. I think I've got it. Thank you, everyone. And the with that, approve, the minutes just, are approved. Yep, you're good. You're good. You're good. You can go on to public comment or public feedback. Right. So I unfortunately had a pretty rough March. Um, health-wise, and so I wasn't able to hold my own public listening session, um, but I just wanted to extend this out to the rest of the members and see if anyone else was able to connect with your communities or or do any listening sessions or consult with your departments if you're state appointed, um, and if you have any feedback that you would like to share with the rest of the task force at this time.
Did anyone do any outreach to their respective communities? But we I haven't done any formal outreach, but informally, just knowing what uh, that I'm on the task force, I have individual members sort of providing feedback. And I can do that in a separate document if you'd like to, but uh, I haven't done any formal. Thanks, Renji. Is that something you have information that you could share now that we could hear about? Or is that something you want to think about for a minute and put into a Let document? Me think about it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me get some time to think about it and I can provide um, some feedback. Sounds good. Uh, this is Jeremy. I reached out to um, some of the provider networks. Um, I have not yet heard back on um, on their thoughts, but um, we'll continue to to probe and and see if there's a position. So far, I think um, you know there, there's a wide range of opinions um, related to related to this topic, and so nothing really um, consensus. But once I get all the feedback, I can see if I can compile that into a single document for for folks to review. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Others? Yeah, Helen. Hi, just to say that um, I too will kind of uh, circle back and, and maybe uh, provide you with maybe like a paragraph or something, you know, something you've written, but I'll do that. Wonderful. Next, next, next meeting. Okay. That's great. Thanks, Helen. Anyone else? Hi, this is Courtney. I can just, I've been meeting with some of my colleagues and um, other providers as well, and I can produce a document, but just to kind of give an overview, we've been talking a lot about um, inclusivity um, when, we, when we're thinking about regulation and policy on providers um, participating in, you know, what it looks like to provide these medicines. All right. Thank you, Courtney. I uh, will look forward to seeing that. Um... Feedback. Anyone else? Yeah, I talked to um, Laura Hermer, who is the is a um, professor at Hamlin Law School, and um, I think uh, it'd be probably best to wait and see what well, I'm curious to what Shane has to say about some of the right to try stuff. So I I have more questions than anything. So. Um, yeah, so I'll just kind of wait and see and then follow up there. That sounds good. Thank you, Michael, for taking the initiative on that. Um, anyone else? Really happy Buju. to see people engaging. Yes, Donovan? Buju, this is Donovan Sather, Red Lake Nation, Ojibwe Connection. Um, so I reached out, I went to a, a community meeting. I spoke with leadership um, locally within our tribe, some tribal members, some other colleagues uh, throughout the Minnesota. And we were discussing like medicine or not and kind of um, on the topics of the, the breakout groups through the legal and um, the other couple groups that I was able to sit in with. Um, one of the biggest things like to keep in mind is accessibility and how tribes will have be able to navigate access through the medicine and utilizing the medicine on our lands, like state insurance plans, 638 IHS programs and IHS uh, billable services. And when it comes to you know, dosage amounts, it's kind of like keeping it like what we, I think what I've heard, we as in the indigenous communities looking at like the, the microdosing is probably the most beneficial um, and mm -hmm. regulating that kind of use and the supply within our borders and our lands. And then just researching the indigenous method methodologies that uh, since time immemorial, we have, we've always kind of utilized some sort of medicines and medicines come at different times and times of need. And just to remind the, the committee again is, you know, there were, combating a uh, fentanyl and opioid crisis, which really entails into the, the mental health stability of our, our tribal members. So just kind of thinking about those areas and just wanted to echo some of those comments that I was able to reach with the community and the different groups that I've spoke with. Um, uh, that's a little update. I do have a little bit of a, a type uh, that I could send on to the group uh, and post in a mural. I'm kind of having a little bit of difficulties getting into it right now. So, all right, miigwech. Thank you, Donovan. All right, anyone else? 
have updates from your community? All right. <laughs> Hearing no more, I, again, really appreciate, thank you to the members that are reaching out and, and, and trying to provide more information to help us do our work and make sure all Minnesotans are represented in the work that we're doing. Um, so next I wanna talk about um, briefly, uh, we don't necessarily need to make any decisions right now, but the um, I think it would be wise for us to consider allocating more authority to other members through a vice chair role and working group chair roles. So as I kind of alluded to a little bit ago, I had a bit of a rough month in March health-wise, and I wanted to ensure that others are deputized to help run things if for some reason I become unavailable or don't have capacity. Being the chairperson for this task force has been a lot of work, a lot more than I had anticipated, and that was written in the charter in the chairperson role. So I think it would be good to get more formal help from the task force members, especially since we've lost Chrissy Deutsch um, as sort of like a full-time staff um, to help with this work. And so it's really kind of on us as the members to pick up the slack there. Um, so um, we don't really have time to dig into this too much today. Um, we can potentially open it up for discussion later if we do have more time, um, but we do have quite a lot to cover today. Um, so I'm just proposing the idea and I did send out um, descriptions in sort of draft form of what those roles and obligations would look like. So just for context, I initially proposed to Bennett to be the vice chair, given that he ran to be the chairperson at our first meeting. But I also want to give others the opportunity to reflect on these extra duties and roles and whether you would want to nominate yourself and put it up for a debate and vote at the May meeting. May meeting. So I'll briefly open this up for discussion to hear what people think about this. If you can just raise your hand if you have thoughts or comments. My only comment, Jessica, I think it's a wise decision to do this and thank you for the assistance you've already provided for the committee. Yeah, thanks, Renji. Bennett? Um, I just want to, uh, even though my name is, is uh, my hat is in the ring, I want to encourage other people to uh, apply for this um, and and do the same if, if they're interested, because um, I'm, I'm interested in doing it, but I also have some capacity issues. And if there are other people who are ready to um, step up into that role, I would, I would encourage them to, to give it a shot. Thanks, Bennett. And this is Stacy. I am, um, summoning everybody to where on the mural that, uh, description is. So if you want to take a closer look at it, it's right here. I'm also just by the way, going to turn off all the cursors cause it's getting, uh, loud in there. So it's right there for those of you that want to take a look at it. it was also included, as Jessica mentioned, in the email that went out to everybody else. Uh, and it will be available on the website uh, with the mini materials. So everybody has access to it. Thanks, Stacey. I think, um, Paula, I saw your hand up for a sec. Yep. Yeah, I would just uh, echo that I would support Bennett taking the, the chair, the vice chair position. And in the, you know, in the spirit of getting things done, if he's open and there's no other discussion, if we could maybe just vote and then we could maybe decide on chairs in our work groups uh, just to kind of keep it moving because I don't know if it needs to, be, it needs to be delayed another month. And I, I would prefer to um, give people a month to decide if if they are interested in the role as well. I, I don't want to um, put this to the group and then have everyone vote like three minutes later if there's just, if there's other people who can consider it and and think they'd be right for the role that the task force sh should consider. That That's just my two cents. Thanks, Bennett. Thanks, Paula, for the suggestion. Any other thoughts about this before we move on? OK, hearing none. Um, Jess, do you want to put up the um, agenda again? And I can just kind of walk through um, today's desired meeting outcomes. We're just getting that queued up on the screen. So, um, so first we're gonna go over um, a detailed review of this decision flow chart and timeline that Nick Kaur from uh, MAD has put together. Um, and it's really a detailed review and we're gonna have a detailed review and discussion to assess as a group, whether we're on track with um, the tasks that we are charged to do um, according to the legislature. 
Um, and then uh, we're going to go through some working group updates and task force input. And the goal here is for members to stay abreast of what the small group work um, sequencing is and then have an opportunity to weigh in on our process um, and how to keep moving forward. And so we're going to cover updates from the legal working group, um, which we might require a little bit more time for discussion and feedback. Um, and then we'll talk about updates from the regulatory work group and then the policy work group. Um, this will be followed by a research update. Um, Carolyn Johnson will talk about some of the results from the LSD clinical trials that have been happening, and we'll open that up uh, for discussion. Um, and then we will close the meeting out today with our guest speaker, subject matter expert Shane Pennington, um, who has joined us today to talk about his experience working um, with you know, FDA and DEA issues around controlled substances and how these things are taking shape across the nation. Um, so we are now going to move into talking about this decision flow chart and timeline review. Um, so this is on mural. If folks can um, follow Stacy over to that part of the mural and then Nick Core is going to come on and do a little um, overview of this workflow chart that he put together so that we can all kind of understand where we're at um, and where we're going. Nick, you want to take it so away? just to just to clarify, Nick is going to share his screen now. I've released everybody, so you're not following what I'm seeing uh, because Nick's going to show the way. So go ahead, Nick. Yes, I will share my screen. Hi, everyone. My name is Nick Kaur. For those of you who I have not met yet, I'm another one of the consultants at MAD. Um, so I'll share my screen here. Um, so we put together sort of this flow chart, and I'll zoom in just in a in a bit. Um, we put together this flow chart to help get us give us a sense of sort of where things are at um, and what we still need to do um, and uh, and just really to give a broad overview. Um, so I'm going to walk through this flow chart and then Jess is going to talk a little bit more about where we're at right now and what we still need to sort of figure out. Um, so as we know, in sort of, you know, December, January, that's when we started really meeting and digging in. And um, there's sort of like two flows here, right? There's the there's the work group flow chart, and then there's the scientific research flow chart here. This is scientific research. This is sort of like the work group flow chart. Okay. So um, the work group started. Um, the, there are currently sort of two legal work groups that are working right now. There's the legal group two work groups that are working right now. There's the legal work group and there's the regulatory work group. In green are sort of the statutory requirements in the legislation. Um, and in these work groups, they're really thinking about research, talking to experts, organizing their ideas, learning, things like that. And we kind of thought about, you know, what are the main questions that they need to figure out within these work groups? Number one is to be able to understand and lay out the issue, to really think about how other states have navigated that specific that specific issue to think about how minnesota uh um navigated the issue as it relates to cannabis and then how it impacts tribal law and relations and there may be some other questions that uh, we need to figure out as well after they've sort of thought about all that stuff they will then organize that information and then they'll present that information to the full task force. And note that that is happening in July. So that's sort of when the full task force will start sort of reviewing all of this information that's happening from the work groups. And then after that, there will be a process for the task force to examine, compare, and discuss sort of all of these findings that have been presented to them in a holistic way. They'll make, you all will then make your decision. And then there will be a drafting of a, a report and the report will be submitted. And so the report is due, as you all know, January, 2025. The drafting will start in September of 2024. So the decision will need to be made before that. So I'm gonna bring us back to where we are now. We are in April of 2024 where we are still trying to figure out all of these issues, right? So that's why we've had a lot of these speakers come in to speak. That's where the task force work groups are sort of like in the weeds, right? In the weeds of figuring out these questions in addition to a number of other questions that we need to think about. So that's the flow for 
this sort of work group flow. Um, and Jess is going to talk a little bit in just a little bit about what is the other stuff that we really need to think about as we um, as we are working in these work groups and are so that we can have all the information that we need to present to the full task force, the full range of ideas and thoughts and sort of findings that we need to have. So that's sort of like the work group flow. There is a separate flow here that is a little bit more simple. Um, that's about scientific research. And that's sort of like what Caroline has been doing and presenting to us, um, surveying literature, comparing the efficacy of the different psychedelic medicines. And then she will then present that information to the full task force um, around the same timeline as when those these work groups will present their information, full findings to the task force. Um, so before I turn it over to Jessica to talk a little bit about what is this other stuff to, to make sure all we're thinking about all the things we need to know, what is that stuff we need to know? I'm going to stop and see if there are any questions about this specific flow chart. Hello, Nate. Yeah, yes. Donovan. Um, so does this allow for consultation with tribes or is that primarily on me and Guthrie to collect that data and bring to the group? Is that the process we envision or met, uh, imagine? I mean, Donovan, I think that's a really good question. I know that um, Guthrie is planning on going to the MIAC meeting in May. Um, to provide some updates and trying to figure out what that consultation relationship will look like moving forward. Um, so that's kind of an open-ended question. I think for now, kind of using you and, and Donovan or Guthrie, apologies, as the bridge for that. But then all of us, I think, should, you know, be doing our part to reach out and learn about tribal relations in this context. Yeah. And also bringing yeah, on, I you know, a tribal lawyer that can actually speak to these the legal issues around tribal sovereignty and how states policies and, and legal stuff would implement that or um, impact that. If I could just add, quickly, I think that it sort of is like what Jessica said, a both and sort of thing. Um, like, I think you all, of course, are are experts on the on the task force. So we would be leaning and relying on you for a lot of information. And I believe it is up to the full task force to really make sure that it is sort of like embedded and that we are ensuring that we have these questions answered. Appreciate the feedback. Any other questions? Well, and there's also the opportunity to provide comments if you don't want to speak on camera uh, with the sticky notes that are kind of off to the side. If you want to add anything um, onto this flow chart with questions, notes, perspectives, uh, please feel free to do that. All right, so Nick, just one more oh, thing. Yes. Can that be added to the flow chart, please? Just that comment or the the process of collection. Yes, I will add that comment to the flow chart. Thank you. So yeah, great. I will turn it over to Jessica to talk a little bit about this sort of like section that we're in now. Yeah, thanks so much, Nick. Um, so. Um, can you keep sharing your screen so that we can see that? Sure. Thanks. Um, so I do want to take this opportunity to just give a high level summary of what we've learned so far and what we still need to do with the task force. And so I appreciate Nick kind of outlining this decision flow chart so we can organize all of our work and, and really trying to figure out, you know, what have we learned so far? What do we still need to learn? And, and what do we need to do with that information moving forward? And so I just want to make sure that members really understand the process that we're following and the timeline that we're on to ensure that we're on track and for folks to understand what it is we're doing. Um, so up until June, as Nick was saying, we're really doing a lot of learning um, and pinging subject matter experts and trying to understand what the meat of this work really is. So just to, again, remind task force members our legislative charge is to research the therapeutic potential of MDMA, LSD, and psilocybin, and compare those results from clinical trials with those um, three medicines to standard treatments that are already approved, such as antidepressants and talk therapy and things like that. 
um, and see which ones are more effective uh, in comparison. We're also tasked with educating the public on the recommendations that we come up with once we're done with all of our work and we have recommendations, and as well as to evaluate the regulatory and statutory changes needed to legalize these three medicines and figure out what legal pathways give us the most protection uh, from conflicts with the federal government. Um, so I just kind of want to summarize what we've learned so far. So in December, Carolyn talked about the scientific methods and research approaches that we're using to evaluate the therapeutic evidence that exists out in the world around these three medicines. And I did a really high level overview of how the drug development process works through the FDA clinical trials and some potential conflicts that this poses with the unique nature of how these drugs work and the types of criteria that are required for FDA approval, which don't always line up very well as we're digging into this more and seeing some of the limitations of what we can infer from clinical trials that we talked about last month. In January, we brought in our first two sets of subject matter experts who were Robert Rush and Ismail Ali, who talked about what was happening in Oregon and Colorado, efforts in other states that are ongoing, the history of the Controlled Substances Act and how drugs have been regulated by the federal government and how different states are trying to approach these sort of like closed loop systems where they try to contain everything within the state to try and pro potentially protect against conflicts with the federal government through states rights. Then in February, we had Mason Marks come and present to us really talking about how there are potential major federal conflicts by merging some of these state regulated programs with traditional healthcare or medical systems that might be under some kind of jurisdiction of the federal government that could potentially run afoul of things that the FDA uh, may not be okay with um, and riskier policies that might put us in the crosshairs of the DEA as we saw in Georgia with them trying to provide um, cannabis prescriptions in their pharmacy. And noting that decriminalization was likely the least in conflict with federal government because it's really asking states not to enforce federal law, which is not something that Congress has the authority to do under the Anti-Commandeering Act. And finally, in March, we brought in Ariel Clark, who is an attorney working on cannabis and psychedelic business law, and the recommendations that she had around making sure that we're not creating overly burdensome systems that are potentially harmful to the environment, harmful to marginalized communities, and really emphasizing the need for ongoing tribal consultation around this and ethical business practices should any businesses or agencies get spun out from any legal changes that we make in the state around these substances, uh, particularly with magic mushrooms, which a lot of states are considering programs that grow mushrooms and what does that regulated market look like and how much is it going to cost to implement. We also heard from Christine Dindisi McCleave around how different states have been navigating the inclusion of indigenous voices and tribal nations highlighting the history of genocide by the US government and cultural appropriation of different plant medicines and harms that have been done to indigenous communities that have used plant medicines and the ecosystems that they steward in the mainstreaming of psychedelics. And then today at this meeting, we're going to be hearing from another lawyer, Shane Pennington, um, who will be presenting and answering more questions about legal and regulatory realities for state and federal programs aiming to integrate Schedule One drugs into some form of system, regulated system. Um, so I do want to emphasize that we're tasked, what, what we're tasked with is not to write a bill and not to create new laws or regulations or policies ourselves, but essentially to provide a very comprehensive research report about these three psychedelic medicines and providing a set of recommendations based on that thorough research on what we collectively recommend that the state legislature might put into a bill and approve to legalize psychedelic medicines here in Minnesota. And I really wanna stress that we should do our due diligence to be as comprehensive as possible because there's a lot of stuff happening on a national scale around psychedelics. And every month there seems to be new precedent, new trials coming out, new indications of breakthrough therapy, new state programs getting approved or denied where it feels from my perspective, and I've heard this reflected by others, that you know, we're trying to build this structure on a foundation that's constantly changing month to month, especially as we're really leaning on what other states are doing um, or have done or are planning to do. And just kind of seeing some of the pitfalls of the rollout of those things or the criticisms that are coming from those legislatures as bills go through and don't get passed. And there's also the national conversation around FDA approval and rescheduling that I think we just need to keep an open mind about and make sure that we are tapping all of the resources that we can to be very comprehensive and understanding all of this. So having said all this, I wanna run through um, this table I put in Mural. Um, each of you are sent a copy of this. There's one version of it that's extremely busy. Um, so Nick, if you could just scroll down to that table and, and zoom in. Um, so, so the busy version of it is my attempt to fill in 
um, kind of this framework where each of the, the columns or sorry, yeah, each of the columns, um, Nick, can you actually, or can someone scroll down on the screen or maybe I can share mine? I'm sorry. Do you want me to share my screen again? Just to. Um, I will just share the document I sent around, but this is also on mural. Um, so one sec. So I'm going to summon everybody so they can look at it on their own screens. Okay. So this is a word version that and was then sent. you've also got it there. Yeah, so this, I'm sharing my screen. This is the Word version that was sent around. There's also a version of this on Mural that hopefully you can see. Um, and so this is really a template. So I have a version of this I sent out that kind of has all of these boxes filled out based on my understanding of the different legal pathways that we're charged with um, researching and providing a report on based on my experience doing clinical trials, researching what's happening in other states and consulting with, with various lawyers working on um, legislation in different states. So that's the kind of top row of this is really these, these columns of the different legal pathways we're considering. So these first few here um, are ones that were explicitly called out in the legislation um, to look at an administrative exemption to the Federal Controlled Substances Act, seeking a judicially created exemption to the Controlled Substances Act, petitioning the federal government uh, to set up a research program in the United States, uh, exploring expanded access and right to try. And then based on what other states are doing, we've added additional columns for adult regulated use and decriminalization. And then each row in this table is basically, one is the just kind of basic definition of what each of these things are. Um, is this federally legal or not? And then the rest of it is really like different rows around how are we going to implement this? What are the policies and regulations that we need to be thinking about and researching and potentially pinging more subject matter experts to help us really fill in the gaps for all of this so we can write up our report and our recommendations? Um, so this is really a template that I would encourage members. Again, this is on Mural. So if you have ideas of additional legal pathways that we might be missing here, um, so if you want to add any sticky notes of additional legal pathways for additional columns we can put in this table, um, or if you have different ideas for implementation um, for, for what we want. You know, I kind of envision maybe there's an additional row here for each state department that, that might have jurisdiction over some of these things, whether it's the Department of Commerce or the Department of Public Safety. And really just trying to get a sense of kind of where everyone is at. And this table really is going to be the meat and, and, and the majority of the content of the work that we're doing and the things that the working group is really trying to um, come together on and um, provide their perspective and recommendations about. Um, so I would like to just take a moment to um, give people time to interact with this table on Mural. Um, so there are like yellow sticky notes off to the side if you want to add any comments you have about additional legal pathways, additional implementation, or if you have thoughts about what should go in each of these boxes. So I don't want to be leading anybody in a specific direction with, you know, my thoughts about this. I've, I've done my work to kind of fill this out on my own to understand how these things could potentially could be um, put into our report, but I also want others to provide their feedback and perspective on this. So um, we can have that interactive um, exercise here on Mural. Um, and also feel free to open up and, and raise your hand if you have any questions or comments that you wanna talk about um, sort of live as we engage with this. And we have a little bit of time to work got on about that. 10 minutes. Yeah, we've got yeah. 10 minutes, Jess. So again, to reiterate, if you're working on your screen members to interact with the chart, you can see where I'm just grabbing yellow stickies. Best to fill them out outside of the box and then drag them to wherever you want to be. So for example, if you had another option to implementation, like what Jessica was talking about, you said there really should be another row. Pop it down here and write down what you're thinking about in terms of an option. If you've got some specific information that you want to share within one of these boxes, do the same thing. Grab a sticky, fill it out, drag it down to wherever you think it needs to go. You might need to resize it if there are more than one stickies in a square uh, and put your comments in that way. But now you're all pros enough with Mural that you can move things around as you need to. So we'll be quiet and give you some thinking time. Meanwhile, for those of you that are just watching this, 
uh, as a visitor. Uh, maybe Jess can share her screen so that they, those that are watching or observing this meeting can see what we're doing that way. Yeah, Margaret. Yeah, I think this is great. Thank you. It's so comprehensive. My question is, I mean, as a part of the smaller working groups, like the regulatory group, how does the the bulk of the things that we're dealing with in those uh, smaller meetings map onto this document? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think it it's things like trying to figure out like what other state agencies might exist that have infrastructure to implement these things and finding, you know, either subject matter experts that can consult with us at our working groups to help us figure out what the regulations would be or the policies would be around that. If there's an existing infrastructure, can we just kind of merge with that? Or is there something new that needs to be created? So this is really just, you know, giving us a sense of like, who do we need to reach out to? What existing state programs can we tap? about this and what do we need to kind of maybe look outside of what we have in the state and bring in additional subject matter experts to fill in the gaps. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Cause there's so much content that wouldn't actually land on this document that we would have figured out or discussed. So yeah, that helped, that's helpful. Yeah. And yeah, feel free to add rows and columns or ideas for new rows and columns if there's things that we've missed. Like I think there's not a row for there's a row for tribal consultation, but not veteran, you know, consultation. So that could be another thing that's that's missing. And this is Stacey. I'll just remind those of you that are using the mural here. If you're trying madly to click on the surface of this document to create a sticky, it's not going to do it for you. You need to be outside of the surface of the document and either drag a sticky that's pre-made down to where you want it to be or click outside of the document to make your own sticky. Hi, this is Ari. Um, I'm also wondering if we could like link to our principles or you know our pillars that we created in our first meetings so that they're handy at the side here like you know what are some of the things that we should be thinking about across all of the different rows for instance like i know jessica we had this we have a row that's about equity and access and justice but perhaps equity should also be embedded across every row, you know, maybe we would want to have sort of like a, uh, an arrow going from top to bottom that says equity, you know, or, or some of those other principles that we're interested in carrying through. Uh, this is Stacy. I'm happy to just make copies of your five, no, it's five, one, three, four, five, six, seven guiding principles and put them down by this table. Would that be helpful? Yes, that'd be super helpful. Thank you. Yep. All right, it's going to take me a minute or two, but we're going to work until 1030 to do this. So right, Shane, you had a question or comment? Yes, I know I'm not a member of the regulatory working group, but there was a question about what how things might map on. And just from some experience with some of the stuff, I would say uh, one thing to keep in mind or think about or, you know, uh, analyze in, in a group like that might be the administrative feasibility uh, timing and resource wise of different paths, which, you know, may be reflected in the chart, but just those with regulatory expertise are going to be well positioned. You know, some of these might require hiring new people or, you know, you already have experience with something like this or you don't, you know, just something to think about because not all of these paths are created equal along those lines. And when you get down to actually doing it, you know, as we all know, those things can start to really matter. Yeah, thank you, Shane, for that. <laughs> I 
All right, everybody, this is Stacy. I've moved your guiding principles from the green original boxes, individual boxes up at the very top during your first meeting down to the right bottom side of the table that you're working on right now. Might be the best positioning. Not perfect, but it's there and closer to you, to it for you. This is Jessica's voice here. We're just going to have about three more minutes for this and we'll take a, a 10 minute break. Hey, this is Jessica's voice here. Um, just want to give folks the opportunity for a 10 minute break uh, so folks can come back at 1040 um, and we'll resume and talk about our working group updates. Uh, feel free to keep adding stuff to the to this table. Um, we probably will dig into it a little bit more with directed questions for our, our special guest Shane Pennington um, if there's time for that. And um, thank you everyone for <laughs> Putting all the sticky notes already, I really appreciate the engagement on this table. Um, so we'll see you all back here at 1040. Hey, Stacy. Sorry, Stacy says <laughs> not to bother you. I know you're on break. Um, uh, it's no, no worries. That's why I'm on camera. What's uh, what's yeah, your question? I, I appreciate it. I I got a call. I gotta I gotta take a, a medical call for a minute. But um, but I'll be back. Um, give me like ten or fifteen minutes, okay? Okay, this is great. Except I don't know who's talking. Who's talking? Oh, it's, it's Dr. Nicholas Leonard's. <laughs> okay, um, thank yeah, you. And, uh, and I yeah, yeah no, I just ha I have a, a clinical issue, and so the um uh I I was gonna say that <laughs> the the policy legal stuff I have no, it's not my so you know it's not my wheelhouse. I should say, but I, I but I do, I do want to have, I have a few comments about, uh, you know, the, the actual psychedelic medicine as a medicine sort of uh, review and data and all that oh. kind of stuff. So don't, um, don't, I will be back. And so, so and I, I do want to put my two cents in because I think absolutely yep. just from a, from a personal standpoint or professional standpoint, uh, you know, from, from my perspective, again, it's, you know, because I'm in the office of medical cannabis as well. And when we went to medical sort of like adult use, that it's a completely different ballgame because as a physician, right. you want to say like, okay, so what's the problem? First off, yeah. what, what, you know, what, where's the data that demonstrates at least uh, you know, non-inferiority, let alone superiority of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think because of all the regulatory issues and, and we can get into this, but you know, there isn't any data out there. And so, and so from we, if we, if we say it's medicine, the, from a provider standpoint, people are going to be like, and where is the data? And it's going to be really hard yeah. from a, yeah. to make yeah. that argument in and of itself. So, and I know we're not there, we're not making that type of thing. What we're doing is just creating a report for the legislature, but I do yeah. think that it's, we need, we need to keep that in mind as we, mm -hmm. and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I, I got to run, yeah. but I, I will be, yep. I'll be back. Okay. Thanks, Stacey. Excellent. Thanks, yeah. Nick. I know we're on break. I wanted to provide a bit of a commentary, Stacy. This is Jessica. Just yeah. Just before you do, I'm just um, I'm just sending you the um, run a show that I've been looking at today. I, I saw your message, so it doesn't have a, a a message in the memo line, but I'm just sending you that copy. Okay. What's up? Oh, just to to Nick's Nick Leonard's comment around like where's the evidence? And I would say for the Office of Medical Cannabis, like the evidence for medical cannabis is not there either. And yet there was a medical program created. Well, in 
Yeah, I think what I was hearing from that is he's very much hoping he can be back from the quick um, uh, step away he needed to do so he could be part of the conversation for the um, psychedelic medicine definition um, discussion that was going to go on a little while. So I, I think it was hold the thought, no, he's got stuff to say. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sorry, I'm eating something. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And I can push all of that to the end of the working group update so that he's for sure there. Oh, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. And then we'll also be talking about this in the context of Caroline's update for the LSD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And I think you're sharing your screen right now. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure for the YouTubers that we oh. take a break. But but the script is, oh, no, wait, I have got so many windows open. It's not even funny right now. Okay. All right, we're good. For folks that can hear my voice, this is Jessica. Just want to let everyone know we have about two minutes left uh, before we come back from our break at 1040. Thanks. And Jessica, it looks like it is 1040. If you're in position and the rest of our team is set to go, I think we could start again. Yes, thank you. And I was got distracted by an email. OK. Um, all right, so thanks, everyone, for um, joining us again. This is uh, Jessica Nielsen's voice. So now we're going to go into um, some working group updates um, from our different working group meetings. So we've had quite a few working group meetings this past month in March. We kind of doubled up on a few of them just to make sure we were able to cover more bases and because we were feeling a little bit behind and, and wondering like, are we making enough progress? And so we did hold some extra meetings. So we'll do uh, first a regulatory update from Margaret um, and then we'll do a policy update from Courtney and then I'll close things out with the legal working group update and a mural exercise around our definition of psychedelic medicine. All right, so uh, Margaret, do you wanna go ahead and come on screen and provide your update from the regulatory working group? Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. So um, we've had two meetings on the 11th and the 25th of March and one meeting with uh, Brett Waters, um, who is a lawyer and also runs a nonprofit. So the themes of our discussion, um, one, I'll circle back with you, Jessica, because our first meeting was focused on what is psychedelic medicine. Um, and there's some of the themes of the discussions that were, are coming up are distinguishing between medical versus non-medical pathways and the recommendations and starting to look at how we regulate the substances in different tracks, right? If it's using the medical model or if it's outside of the medical system and conversations around the safety guidelines that are going to be needed in, um, and how to facilitate those safe, safely. Um, and as well as two tracks of health professionals using them and other types of certified individuals and kind of what would that even look like. Again, kind of coming back to making sure we look at cannabis as the, the pathways on how to model these things and a discussion around who owns um, the right to a natural plant. We spent some time talking about that and then looking at using differences and approaches from actual plants versus synthetic substances. So there it looks like, you know, overall we're going to need multiple layers of recommendations due to differences in the substances themselves and how they're accessed and administered. So there's not a one size fit all approach. So that's the high level summary. Thanks so much, Margaret. Does anyone have any questions or thoughts about what Margaret shared? You want to come on camera or ask your question? Yes, Adam. Yeah, one issue that we discussed would be what about the Office of Cannabis Management, you know, just the new fledgling office to potentially in the future, if we were going to go two different routes, have like adult regulated use for naturally grown psilocybin containing mushrooms 
versus more of the traditional medical model for the synthetics. Um, I, I spoke with the general counsel at the Office of Cannabis Management. He was generally receptive to the idea of that office being the entity eventually to also regulate psilocybin containing mushrooms, which was encouraging. Um, they don't have the bandwidth right now to provide any guidance for us or regulatory advice. They're scrambling right now to come up with the rules for cannabis, but uh, it seems like they might be the best position government agency to look at adult regulated use and regulate the uh, psilocybin containing mushrooms. This kind of like natural plant medicine, decriminalized nature type uh, movement with both cannabis and psilocybin. Thanks, Adam. Anyone else have any regulatory questions based on what was shared by Margaret? All right, if not, then we can move on to Courtney. Courtney, do you wanna um, unmute yourself and give the uh, update from the policy work group? Sure. Um, so there's quite a bit of overlap, I would say. We talked about some of the same things we were looking at uh, or, or discussing the differences or between synthetic and um, natural uh, psilocybin. So, um, and, and then kind of just reviewing the legal pathways again. Um, I guess one of the things that came up that was different is um, licensing boards. We talked a little bit about what that looks like in the state of Minnesota compared to other states and um, what other states are doing or some of the mistakes they've already made and looking at how they've had to go back and kind of reevaluate and how we can use, you know, look at what they've done to consider how we want to approach sort of facilitation or facilitators. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of sums it up. Thanks so much, Courtney. All right, any, any high level questions or comments about kind of those policy updates that Courtney provided? Okay, hearing none, um, I'll go ahead and move forward with the legal working group update. So this will be a little bit more um, meatier, uh, full of, of content. And I do have an interactive exercise on mural that I would like folks to engage with that I'll get to in a minute. So I'll close out my update with this exercise that we're going to do around the survey that I put out around trying to really figure out what, from your perspective, is the definition of psychedelic medicine, not just like its formal definition in the legislature, but like how that is implemented in terms of like what is medicine and how um, are we going to practice that um, and implement that and disseminate that. Um, so initially, so we also had two meetings this past month and we know we've been kind of grappling within the legal working group is um, one big topic that keeps coming up is that we potentially need to approach our recommendations for the three drugs differently because they're at different stages of clinical trials and public acceptance and different state programs are exploring different options. So we have this scenario where MDMA could potentially be FDA approved by August. That's not guaranteed, but it's you know being evaluated right now by the FDA and they are um, promised to give their, their update and decision on that in August. Um, so that could look very different in terms of how we implement that um, compared to you know LSD, which is just now being considered to start phase three clinical trials for generalized anxiety disorder. Towards the end of this year, it was just granted breakthrough therapy designation. So now all three of these drugs have this designation from the FDA. Um, and then psilocybin obviously is a little bit different because it also is now in several different phase three clinical trials um, for a synthetic pharmaceutical version. But then there's also the ability to grow mushrooms very easily, which a lot of people are considering and other states are doing. Um, so other topics that were discussed in the legal working group were things that keep us the most out of conflict with the federal government, which includes um, not blending programs with the healthcare system that likely have federal oversight and licenses that could be revoked by the feds, and the option of decriminalization being the least in conflict, um, other than just doing what is already legal, which would be FDA and DEA authorized clinical trials, which doesn't necessarily require legislation, just requires a lot of funding uh, and licenses to implement. Uh, but there's already a kind of a pathway for that that we don't necessarily need to legislate or provide recommendations to other than funding. 
Um, we also discussed the idea of figuring out which existing state agencies could adopt regulations around this, um, as Adam was alluding to around psilocybin um, and infrastructure that's already set up for how to deal with, you know, producing and managing and regulating um, and dealing with the legalities of Schedule One drugs uh, that are Schedule One at the federal level. Um, some of the other legal pathways that we're tasked with exploring could have implication impl implications for changing federal law and policies, but we talked about how it's not really the purpose of our group to change things at the federal level. We're tasked with focusing on Minnesota laws that are the easiest um, to implement and the least likely to attract too much federal attention. There was also discussion about looking at what other countries are doing, uh, like the Netherlands, where psilocybin products have been sold and used for many, many years without much issue. Um, there's also the fact that there's decriminalization in a lot of different cities around the country, including here in Minneapolis. So we could ping that data to figure out what does that look like um, and what's the data and like public safety concerns around that, if any. We also discussed the Right to Try Act um, and how the Minnesota version of the Right to Try Act doesn't seem to exclude Schedule One drugs like the federal one does, but it's also um, limited to only allowing um, use for people with a terminal illness. Um, we also discussed how to navigate legal protections against sexual abuse and other harms in facilitated sessions with these medicines, and again, relying on existing state statutes about consequences for violating people's autonomy and consent. Okay, so getting back to this question around, you know, what is psychedelic medicine? So again, orienting folks to the, the mural. Um, so if you all recall, I sent out a survey a couple months ago trying to get each of your unique perspective on what psychedelic medicine is and how we would implement that. So in the mural, there is um, a section that if you're following Stacy, she can orient you to that. Um, so there's a PDF that you can open that has this description um, or basically the survey results of, of what most of you provided. Um, I think five people didn't respond, but for the most part, most of you did. So thank you so much for engaging with that survey and just kind of breaking down what each person's thoughts were about psychedelic medicine and then how we actually want to handle this. And do we consider it something that should only be in the medical framework? Should it be non-medical? And so with that on mural, there is this table below that I've created to really try to come to a consensus about this because there was kind of a mixed bag of some people thinking it should only be within the medical system, but I did see more of a consensus um, from members around there being kind of these like non-medical options to explore for a variety of reasons, not just access, but also just conflicting with federal government and merging it with healthcare, which is potentially problematic um, in terms of rolling out that um, and the costs involved and the consequences. Um, so what I want folks to do is really engage with this table. And again, there's these sticky notes on mural. I don't know if that's being shared yet. Okay, so, so in the PDF document that has the results of the survey, you kind of have it broken down by each member and their kind of raw response to the survey. And then I created three columns next to that to kind of think about you know, are we talking about it just from the legal perspective? Like in the legislation, it just says psychedelic medicine is defined as LSD, psilocybin, and MDMA, and that's it. Um, but then other people think about medicine differently. And so we've really kind of been talking about this concept of medicine. And I think a lot of people think that medicine is only the medical model, like what we think of as Western medicine, hospitals, physicians, things like that. But the term medicine is used quite ubiquitously across many cultures in different contexts. A lot of things are considered medicine. Um, so we really want to uh, open up that and be inclusive of all perspectives. Um, and so I really see kind of, you know, these different options laying out where we have clinical, non-clinical, and then I have these different rows in the table on mural around what does that look like to implement from your perspective regarding who's going to be facilitating um, what are the facilities that this is going to be allowed in and what is the supply that we're going to use? And I think there could be another row that I haven't added yet around who can have access, like who are the clients, who are the patients, who are the people that are going to be consuming psychedelic medicines in our state under this program that could potentially be created. So again, want folks to kind of orient themselves to mural and just provide your notes and thoughts with the sticky notes in this um, table that's on mural and just kind of Fill it in and let us know what you think so we can come to an agreement about what we mean when we say psychedelic medicine and also just medicine. So we can open it up for questions if folks want to talk about stuff, um, or we can just sit quietly and engage with the table on mural.
And folks need to click on the PDF in order to see second page, or at least I did. Yeah, down Rin, the lower left. Thanks, Adam. Renji, do you have a question? Yeah, I'm, uh, am I looking at this, the right uh, page here? What context do you want psychedelic medicine to be allowed? The three columns there and then the uh, three rows below that? Correct. Okay. Hey, uh, is there any way, I me? Mean, I'm looking at this right now. Thank you for doing this first, first of all. Uh, there's a facilitator, there's a facility, there's a supply. I don't see anywhere on here, and I'm, again, speaking from the, not necessarily the medical model, but just from a safety and screening model. Where do where does the patient come in? Where does where do we identify is the individual appropriate to to take this? So yeah, that's a, go on. Yeah, and so I would add under as a row, perhaps selection or screening and safety as well, and perhaps even monitoring. Yeah, I mean, if you want to put a sticky down there to add that, and then we can modify this table. Thank you, Randy. I can I can create that for you, Casey. And it, what would you want it titled, Renji? Uh, selection, patient selection, or I let's just not use the word patient selection. Just say individual I, selection user. slash safety slash monitoring. So individual selection. Stacey, are you able to unlock the table and I can just add a row? A couple rows. Yeah, I'm not sure how you made it, but I'll unlock it for you. <clears throat> Go ahead. You Jessica. might not oh, want you to do that right now, Jessica, because people are engaging in it. Yeah, I think the sticky will be good. Individual section selection here. Yep. And then I'll just put some boxes in for the clinical and non-clinical. And Renji, you had a, a thing like another row for screening or would that fall under individual selection? You're muted. Yeah, Jessica, I think that uh, selection really is screening. So what I'll do is I'll add to what Stacy. And we have some time to engage with this and have some discussions around this. So we we have until about 11.20, uh, so about 24 more minutes um, if we want to do that. Hey, Ranji. Sorry, this is uh, Dr. Nicholas Sanders over at MDH. And I, I was just wondering, when you're talking about screening and selection, are you, are you sort of looking at patient criteria for uh, use of the psychedelics um, as in, you know, certain diagnostic criteria or, or things of that nature? Is that is that what you're thinking? I think that's one way of looking at it, Nick. Thanks for your comment. Uh, I'm really looking at it, but from a safety standpoint, are these individuals that are on uh, any medications that might uh, interact with any of the psychoactive substances with psilocybin? Do they have comorbid schizophrenia or psychotic disorders that they would be not a good candidate for, in fact, would be harmful for? Are these individuals that are, you know, if and so I, I, of course, I'm looking at it from a medical model, but I see that there's a pathway that we could use this in a non-medical model in a facility, perhaps with, you know, people that are trained to be able to facilitate. And, and if that's the case, I just want to make sure that individuals that pass through this are completely, one, have an informed consent of what they're proceeding with, number one. Number two, that they're screened for any appropriate medical conditions that could be exacerbated by these medicines including cardiac conditions uh, and psychological and psychiatric conditions. Um, and then, of course, looking for any medication interactions. Sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank All you. Right, everyone. This is, this is Stacy. I made some boxes uh, down below. I've locked them in place so you can go ahead and put things into them. Uh, whoever's holding on to the safety monitoring box, though, needs to let go as soon as you're done so I can resize it and get it locked into place, but no rush. I'll do that in a sec. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Stacey. Um, I also wanted to ask um, Dr. Nick Leonards, I know you had made a comment before the break. I don't know if you want to come back on and, and share that. It was around like the cannabis 
medical programs and and where's the evidence? Oh yeah, I was I was basically saying you know like and and I know that we've talked a lot about policy and regulation and um and so but from from you know which is not my wheelhouse which is why I remain silent because I you know I it's again policy and 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 sort of the legal aspects of this is is not my not my area, but one of the things and when I was talking or when I mentioned to about screening and selection, I, I think it's also important to consider, you know, sort of what is the the data on the efficacy uh, and what are the conditions and does it meet the criteria for, you know, like uh, equivalency or at least non-inferiority to certain uh, uh, therapies as well. And I, and I think that having sort of uh, that perspective as well, keeping that in our mind um, is, 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 you know, is, is quite important as well. So is that yeah. what you're getting, Jessica? Yeah, I think. Um, can you expand a little bit on what you mean by equivalency and non superior or non inferiority? Yeah, so so like I and I always look back to sort of like other medications where there's like a lot of sort of like um you know the sort of like the the gold standard double blind um, randomized control trials with uh, very common chronic conditions such as uh, like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, type two diabetes, you know things like this, and there are like really large sort of like scale studies where there's quantifiable measurements of improvement. You know, if if we like look at one antihypertensive medication and we compare it to another one, we can sort of like we can double blind that people don't know what they're getting or if they're getting the placebo. And then we can quantifiably look at their blood pressure measurements over time. And then we can say like this demonstrates that this is, you know, either equivalent or non-inferior to the current standard of therapy, that kind of thing. And and I think in the in the in sort of the arena of psychedelics, that's more difficult to sort of do just through the nature of psychedelic medicines in and of themselves. Um, and so I, I think we just need to um, be aware that, you know, what conditions are we thinking uh, psychedelic medicines would be appropriate for and what does the data tell us regarding the efficacy or at least the non-inferiority of these four stated medical conditions. And I know that Carolyn, Dr. Johnson has has done a lot of research on this and I've, I've done a real sort of brief overview of, of what she's found and so, um, anyway, I just I just always like to keep that in mind uh, as as we move forward. So, because I do think that, um, you know, when we look at, uh, and and I'm I'm involved a little bit in the office of medical cannabis as well. And when we looked at sort of like like the the conditions, the qualifiable conditions for medical cannabis, uh, you. you know, we we also have to look at that. And then, the, but then there's also adult use, and there's there's other aspects with that as well. So, anyway, um, I don't I don't want to belabor the point, but. No, I appreciate that. Um, I think so. Caroline's going to be talking about kind of the comparisons of what are the clinical trials showing with these three drugs? What are the conditions that are being investigated? And then doing meta analyses of comparing those results with what are the standard lines of treatment, whether it's antidepressants or cognitive behavioral therapy or things like that. So that will be in kind of the research report. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, I'm curious around kind of the evidence for medical cannabis because the clinical trials around that have not been great. And yet right. the state still approved a program and had specific conditions that I don't think were entirely evidence-based. So I'm curious <laughs> what your yeah. thoughts are on that. Yeah, no. And it's in, and again, I, I think there's, and and I, I, I really don't want to speak out of my sort of like my understanding because I think this goes far beyond sort of like the, like the medical arena, because I think there's a lot of push as far as cannabis from a legal regulatory that that sort of thing and so i think there's different pushes and pulls regarding use of of uh of medical cannabis and and all that kind of stuff so i think there's a lot of for lack of a better term public pressure to sort of come up with something but i but i do think i think it's very very difficult again that the clinical trials regarding medical cannabis and it's a very from my read it's a very um polarizing topic or at least historically has been and so that you're going to have data that's going to be that the, the results are going to be like very much you kind of know what the results are going to be based upon who's conducting the trial or how it's being sort of done and then you have sort of like the the other group are saying like no there's no efficacy there's no benefit you know in, in certain types of conditions and so uh, yeah it's very very difficult to sort of come up with qualifying conditions and for instance something as i think as common as generalized anxiety disorder and there was a lot of back and forth between should this be a qualifiable condition for medical cannabis and um and and you know the the data is as you were saying like it's it's not um it's not clear cut as far as the utility um and then and then i think um also like the criteria for a diagnosis of general anxiety disorder is oftentimes i think nebulous at best um as far as the actual practice 
of a diagnosis of GAD. And so, and I, and I know that I'm not a psychiatrist and, but I would love to hear Dr. Ranji's uh, opinion on that as well. But, um, but yeah, it's, you know, how do we, how do we take something like that? And, um, and, and, you know, it, it, I think it just it shows that it's, it's difficult to take, um, you know, qualitative results and, and sort of apply that, especially um, in in various conditions, when you have a regulatory thing that that isn't isn't uh, easily studied. So, Nick, I uh, I'm just going to comment on what mm -hmm. you were saying. I think you're absolutely right. It we're in a space where we just don't have a lot of data. We have some data. We don't have a lot of data. There's robust data. There's good data on TRD depression with psilocybin. Um, some with G GAD, but we have just started the the pro our I think uh, some fine institutions have done some really good work on, on looking at this. So we're very early on. So having this discussion, I don't think it's premature. I think it's actually a very good um, discussion because this is the sort of conversations we'll have with medical practitioners across the state, particularly with psychiatrists that whom I've heard of are fairly skeptical. To answer your question about the GAD uh, and just making these diagnoses, it's, it is, you know, at times difficult because, you know, psychological symptoms can't be purely quantified. We do have questionnaires that are fairly reliable. Um, but, um, and so, you know, you can't just put a blood pressure monitor on someone and uh, or similarly to someone who has a psychological condition. But um, I think we're fairly good at identifying GAD in, in individuals. So, uh, but it's, it's not perfect. Thank you both for that medical dialogue. That was very helpful and informative. Um, I was just looking at our updated agenda. Apologies, I think I said we have until 11.20. We actually have until 11.10, so about five more minutes to engage with this table on mural. I don't see many things being added, so if folks want to just try to engage and put your thoughts on kind of where you think things should land from your perspective around um, what context do you want psychedelic medicine to be allowed. And this is Stacy. I, I would just dovetail onto that, Jessica. If any of you members are not clear on the directive for um, sharing your thoughts here, if you want Jessica to go over like what she's looking for a little bit more, or if there is a reason behind your reluctance to put something or your thoughts on the table, let us know that too. We just want to make sure that we're capturing some some useful information moving forward so this time together is really important margaret go ahead yeah thank you you are articulating i'm looking at it i have lots of thoughts and i'm thinking what is the most useful way for me to comment what are what are you looking for here what would be the most helpful yeah yeah thanks i appreciate that um so really trying to figure out do you think that you know facilitators should be licensed clinical facilitators, or do you think there should be non-clinical facilitators? Do you think the facility should be a hospital setting or a clinic, or should it be some other non-clinical facility? For the supply, do we want to only rely on the kind of pharmaceutical products that are being pushed through the FDA pipeline, or do we want to consider other options like with psilocybin growing mushrooms? Um, and then around individual selection and screening, like what types of people um, do you think would be appropriate either should it be clinical only they need a diagnosis or non-clinical it could be open to anyone that's just looking for wellness and spiritual connection or community healing um, as suggestions and then safety monitoring under each of those umbrellas and so just really trying to get people to think about like in, in, in our thinking about the working groups of like the who what where when why we really want to kind of fill that out so we can figure out our recommendations around all of that and if it's a yes and right so for example yeah. I have two pathways in my mind going down. I'm, I'm just not sure how to, I can just bring up those comments on the using the sticky notes here, I guess, right? Yeah, and I would say they're not mutually exclusive. So yeah. you can have both, right? So we, we get to create or provide recommendations on a system we think is the best. So what does that look like? Because like, like I said, you know, we might be thinking about this different for the different drugs. So there might be clinical options for one and non-clinical for the other, as an example. Thank you. Hey, this is Jessica's voice here. Um, we're due for a break right now. Folks can continue to engage on the mural exercise, um, but I do want to give folks another chance for a break uh, before we come back. Um, so we'll take another 10 minute break and come back at 1120. 
um, to talk about uh, Carolyn's uh, research update on the LSD clinical trials. So thank you all again for all your participation and engagement on Mural, and we'll see you back here at 11.20. And if you were mid note, sorry for summing any everybody and making you dump your note on the other table. So you're gonna to have to drag it over to the right one. Task Force members, this is Jessica's voice here. Just giving everyone a heads up uh, two more minutes and then we'll come back from our break to resume. Hi, Jessica, this is Jeremy. I just want to give you a heads up. I have to drop at noon, um, but um, uh, appreciate you leading this this meeting. I just want to give you a heads up in case there wasn't uh, time to give you a heads up before that. So thanks. I appreciate that, Jeremy. I think we are planning to end a little bit early today, so hopefully you won't, you won't miss too much. Sweet, thanks. All right, folks, it's 1120. We're going to come back uh, from our meeting. Um, if folks can make your way back to your computer, come on camera if you're able. Um, so now we're going to go into um, a research update on LSD. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Caroline, who's going to uh, present her work on the research she's been doing around some of the evidence for LSD. Take it away, Caroline. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, so today we're finally getting to some science. Um, you might have seen that I sent a document with the overview of what I'll be talking about today. So the hope was that today wouldn't maybe be the first time you're coming across this information, but I know that there were a lot of documents sent last week. Um, so if you didn't see it, that's okay. Um, in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to be leaving out some details and talk kind of more high level about the findings, but specifics are in that document for future reference. So that being said, uh, let's jump right in. Next slide, please. So here's just a really quick overview of what we'll be talking about, just so you know what's coming. I'll remind everyone of the health conditions we identified. We'll talk about the data supporting LSD as a treatment for both anxiety and alcohol use disorders. We'll go over clinical risks, um, and then we can discuss with a small mural activity. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, so the following is the list of all the health conditions that were identified in that initial broad search. You'll notice that several of these have been struck out. This is because in this comparison of efficacy portion, the task force voted to only include conditions that have been studied in randomized control trials or RCTs um, and have been published following peer review. So really only um, anxiety and alcohol use disorders had those kind of peer reviewed published RCTs to really be able to compare the efficacy of LSD as a treatment against current standard treatments. Next slide. So for this part, two peer reviewed RCTs investigating LSD as a treatment for anxiety were found on the left, 12 participants with life-threatening illnesses, mostly cancers, um, and anxiety, which was mostly generalized anxiety disorder, were randomized to either a group that received the full experimental dosage of 200 micrograms of LSD or a group that received 20 micrograms. And this was considered the active control group and kind of takes on the role of a placebo. So first, baseline levels of anxiety, as well as depression, for all the participants were scored. Um, and then everyone underwent two sessions over two to three weeks with their assigned dose of the drug, followed by six therapy sessions without any drug. Um, and then two months after the last treatment session in both groups, the same anxiety and depression measurements uh, were conducted and the researchers found reduced levels of um, both anxiety and depression following treatment with that full dose of LSD. At this point, um, participants who received that active control were given the option then to go through the whole thing again with the full dose. Um, these participants were also followed up with it two months. And again, they found a reduction in their anxiety and depression scores. After that, 
all of the participants were followed up um, with the same measures 12 months after their last session with that full dose. And they actually found that those reduced anxiety scores remained at that lower level. However, because all participants had taken LSD by this point, you know, there isn't a control condition that we can compare these results to. But the second study was built upon the first. So here, 42 participants with or without a life-threatening illness, but all with a diagnosed anxiety disorder were included and were randomized to one of two groups, uh, 200 micrograms of LSD again, or a full placebo. Over the course of the experiment, these participants underwent those baseline measurements for anxiety and depression. They received two sessions with LSD or placebo, which were separated by two weeks. And finally, they got five post-treatment therapy sessions. Again, the measurements of anxiety and depression on all those same scales were taken at all of the follow-up sessions. Um, and then a final measurement was taken 16 weeks after that second treatment session. They found that the participants who had received LSD showed significant reductions in both anxiety and depression as compared with that placebo group. So ultimately, the key takeaway in both of these studies is that they found a significant beneficial effect of LSD with psychotherapy on anxiety as well as depression. Now, I know we voted to only include research that's been um, published in peer reviewed journals, but for our discussion today, I think it's also important to bring up some research that hasn't met that criteria net, uh, uh, yet. Uh, next slide, please. Caroline, can I just interrupt for a sec? We have a hand raised, Jeremy. Do you have oh, a yeah, sorry, I cannot see those. Yeah, thank you. I just and I apologize if um if, if you've covered this, but um just for kind of the lay people like myself, can you maybe describe a little bit what does it look like? What does the treatment look like? Is it um um do they get LSD in an office setting and then go through therapy? Is it like a take-home dose? Can you just I, I'm not tracking exactly, I'm trying to visualize what it actually looks like. Oh, but, yeah, for sure. So so this is a, a randomized clinical trial where they stay in the treatment center, whether it's a hospital or a training hospital, it's, it's not a take home condition. So they they go to you know their hospital, the clinic, they receive this dose and they stay there for the full time, right? Six, eight hours um, with, there's two, there's typically two individuals, facilitators with them at the time. So they receive it in the clinic, they stay until the effects have completely worn off and then they are allowed to go home and then they come back for these um, psychotherapy sessions or these kind of integration sessions where they really kind of talk about what they what they went through, if that answers the question. That's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And we have one more question from Renji. Oh, I was just gonna add to that, Carolyn, thanks you, thank you for mentioning that. So there was some sort of preparatory uh, therapy sessions, there was the integration sessions that occurred between the medicine sessions. And so I wanted to make a point that that is part of these particular research trials. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so a lot of these specifics are in that document. I'm also making an even more comprehensive one with statistics that I will send out for anyone who's interested. Um, but yes, there's a there's preparatory sessions, there's the dose, there's an integration session, there's the dose, and then there's several integration sessions. Um, so nobody's really kind of left on their own with this. Any other questions? All right, so let's, let's chat quickly about this. So you may have heard in the news in the last month, um, the biopharmaceutical company Mind Medicine or MindMed they announced positive results from their phase two trial of LSD treatment for generalized anxiety disorder. They also received breakthrough therapy designation from the FDA for this treatment. Something interesting about this trial is that they did not employ a therapeutic component like the last two. Rather, they randomized almost 200 participants to one of five groups, four different doses of LSD, or actually their proprietary formula, which is called MM120, or a placebo group. So before treatment, all participants were scored for their baseline anxiety and depression measurements. 
And then they were given their dose of LSD or placebo. But unlike the previous two studies, there were no follow-up therapy or integration sessions. So the primary data endpoint was four weeks after um, their dose of the drug. And they found statistically significant reductions in both anxiety and depression measurements from baseline in both the 100 and 200 microgram dose groups. So even if they looked at just the 100 microgram group by 12 weeks out after the treatment, 65% of those participants showed a positive response to LSD and nearly 50% showed remission from generalized anxiety disorder. So this means they no longer met that diagnostic criteria. Again, you know, this research has really just finished phase two trials and phase three trials haven't started yet. So we are a ways out from approval, but I think this is something um, that's moving a little faster than we might've predicted at the start of this task force. And I can see a hand this time. Yeah, Adam. Yeah, they, with regarding the mind med recent study, if there was no psychotherapy, what did it look like for the patients to receive this the LSD? Would they be blindfolded and listening to music, and then when the effects wore off, they move on with their life, or what? What setting were they receiving the LSD in? It was again in a clinical setting. They weren't taking it and giving it to go home or, or use it okay. or anything. Um, I wasn't able to attend their live presentation, but as I understand, they follow kind of the same experimental procedure as the other two. So they they show up. There's no active psychotherapy happening during any of these sessions. They're with their facilitators. You know, they're, they're safe. They're given reassurance if they need it. Um, there's no active psychotherapy component. After the drug wears off, then they did not come back for psychotherapy. Thank you. Any other questions? And again, we'll have time at the end for everyone to discuss these as well. Okay, seeing no questions, uh, we can move on to the next slide. So let's talk about comparing the efficacy of LSD treatment against the current standard treatments for anxiety disorders. First of all, the current standard treatments are typically psychotherapy, um, like cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, or other forms of talk therapy, pharmacotherapy, so medications like anti-anxieties, um, antidepressives like SSRIs or similar, or a combination of the two. The appropriate way to compare the efficacy of different treatments is through a meta-analysis, um, which is the statistical combination of the results of multiple studies. And typically one of these outputs that we look at is an effect size. Effect sizes are statistical measures of the magnitude of differences between two populations. The scale of how to interpret these numbers is in that overview document, but essentially the further from zero, the larger the effect. Many meta-analyses have been published on the various current treatments for anxiety, but none have been published on LSD as a treatment, and none have been published directly comparing LSD to these current treatments. We're planning on running our own, but that will take quite some time and isn't ready for today. So in the meantime, we can kind of imperfectly discuss effect sizes, but keep in mind, we are comparing three individual studies against the combination of many studies. Um, so this is not a one-to-one -one comparison. It's kind of just to give some starting context around it. So the effect sizes of the RCTs um, and the meta-analyses, some of the meta-analyses, are listed here on the right. In the interest of time, I'm not just going to read off the numbers, um, but just something to know is that the effect sizes for those RCTs up top are all considered large, right? And I know that this is a lot of numbers, um, but the key takeaway is that the efficacy of LSD, as measured in these three trials, falls within the range of effect sizes found in standard treatments, suggesting that there may be comparable efficacy. But again, remember that this is just three individual studies versus essentially the average of a lot of studies. Um, and, and again, kind of more specifics are in that document as well. Uh, next slide, please. 
So let's shift gears a little um, to talk about LSD as a treatment for alcohol use disorder. So our search turned up five RCTs that met our criteria, all of which were from the 1960s and 70s. And I'm gonna talk about these as a group here. Overall, these studies use really widely variable methodologies. Um, some use a therapeutic component, others didn't. Some had control conditions, others didn't. Um, and even these control conditions weren't always treated the same as the LSD condition. And ultimately, each of these studies concluded that LSD in whatever capacity it was administered uh, wasn't really any more effective than non-LSD treatments. In fact, most all of the participants seemed to improve whether they got the drug or not. But we still want to look at the efficacy of LSD against current treatments, which include three medications, naltrexone, acamprosate, and disulfiram, um, and psychotherapy, particularly CBT, which can be used in conjunction with the medication. Unlike the anxiety trials, um, a meta-analysis directly comparing LSD to these treatments has been published. And unlike those primary IC RCTs, uh, this meta-analysis concluded that LSD treatment did actually result in a significant beneficial effect on both alcohol misuse, so the frequency of drinking or the amount of heavy drinking, um, and total abstinence from drinking. Now, this analysis didn't use effect sizes, rather, they calculated the pooled benefit difference, which is just the percentage of improved patients in the treatment group, so in this case, the drug, minus the percentage of improved patients in the control group. So a larger number indicates a greater difference between drug and control outcomes. Again, in the interest of time, I won't just read off the numbers, also because they are in the document as well, um, but these numbers uh, down here on the right under the second bullet point before the comma correspond to the pooled benefit difference on alcohol misuse and the numbers after the comma correspond to that difference on abstinence for each drug. And so and the important takeaway that this study concluded was that the benefit difference of LSD is comparable to current medications in a direct comparison of efficacy. You'll notice uh, that they didn't include a comparison to CBT. Like with anxiety, this may be something we need to evaluate ourselves. And I know for anxiety, I gave you the results of other meta-analyses. Uh, I'm not gonna do that today with this part, just because the current published meta-analyses on CBT in alcohol use disorder tend to use effect sizes and not this pool benefit difference. And I don't think we'd be able to drive much meaning right now comparing two different scales. Um, next slide, please. So I think the last thing we really need to talk about is the risk accompanying LSD as a therapeutic treatment. In all of these clinical studies, there were actually very few adverse or negative effects. Most of these effects were mild to moderate and only occurred during the actual treatment, but they didn't linger. So negative side effects included some mild anxiety, a few illusions given the nature of the drug, headache, nausea, uh, feeling cold, or just kind of feeling abnormal. There were really only very, very rarely more serious effects during treatment. One patient experienced anxiety with delusions, and one from the alcohol use disorder treatments experienced a seizure. It was noted that this individual had a history of seizures and it may have been associated with alcohol withdrawal. One side effect to certainly pay attention to is the finding that uh, LSD significantly increases blood pressure, heart rate, and body temperature compared with controls. Uh, and this is true in tests in quote unquote, healthy individuals as well. However, it's also important to mention here in lieu of last month's conversation, um, that these trials have been done in very restricted populations. While there were life-threatening illnesses included, participants were excluded if they had other psychiatric disorders, physical disabilities, certain other physiological diseases, were pregnant, um, things like that. And typically, they're not allowed to take any other medication that treated the condition during, for the duration of the study. 
shifting gears again a little, something that I think we should talk about here is the notion of bad trips or those really scary taking uh, drug taking experiences. None of these were reported in the clinical literature at all. What the literature does say though, is that these sorts of negative experiences tend to happen more frequently when LSD is used outside of the clinic with you know, unknown sources or composition or doses of the drug by people who are inexperienced and or in a bad place physically or mentally. Um, so, so really not in the clinic. And I think another thing to note is that LSD actually has a very low potential for abuse and there's really not much of a risk of dependence. And so what that's saying is that there's not really a risk for addiction. And we don't, we don't have time um, today to kind of discuss the adverse effects associated with current treatments, but those are provided in the overview document, um, as is some information about LSD interactions with other drugs. And so I encourage you to kind of skim through that so we can get a full picture of comparing these two drugs or this drug with all the current treatments, um, just so, so we kind of have the full picture. Um, so next slide, please. So with all of this, um, we can kind of start moving to the mural activity, which is uh, actually down below this part. And it's really just a, a quick temperature check on how everyone's feeling about LSD. Right, so just kind of start to think about some of the more concrete aspects around making decisions for this drug. Um, this really kind of goes hand in hand with that table to the left on the mural that Jessica put together. So kind of quickly walk you through it briefly and then we can open up the floor for discussion. So at the top, um, we have kind of this fundamental question of do we even want to recommend moving forward with LSD? So there's blue circles nearby to put uh, your votes on yes or no, um, as well as for the rest of the activity. And then there's stickies in case you want to comment as well. So from there, there's arrows, you know, if you think yes, in what capacity, this more regulated, you know, quote unquote medical, I know we haven't landed on a term for that, but kind of the more regulated uh, aspect, maybe the less medical, quote unquote aspect, you know, do we want to recommend further research or even another approach? Um, and then I think something else that, that we should start thinking about is, you know, do you want to restrict this to certain conditions? Would you like to leave that up to the discretion of the provider? Um, kind of concrete things like that. And again, you know, this is just a starting point to get the group, um, and particularly the work groups, thinking about each drug. Um, so, I'm going to turn it over for everyone to discuss um, how this kind of fits in with the legal, regulatory, and policy decisions um, before the end of the, the session. Yeah, we've got a thanks, Caroline. That was great. Um, we have a couple of questions while folks are looking at the mural. First from Bennett, and then Margaret. Uh, thanks, Carolyn. Um, I have a question for you about um, the more the more research route for LSD. Um, I've read that. LSD is is less studied right now than MDMA or psilocybin, and that part of that has to do um, with the difficulty of studying it given its extended time of efficacy compared to psilocybin or MDMA, which I believe are only effective for you know a few hours, um, whereas LSD sounds like it can be effective for you know twelve hours or something like that. Um, do you see there being any? I'm just hoping you can speak on that specifically. If if we, you know, just projecting out, make a recommendation to the legislature um, that it would that it would be beneficial for the state to uh, designate uh, appropriate money for clinical trials of LSD. Is that something that we should be aware of when we're making a recommendation to the legislature? Uh. Can you rephrase the, the question part of that just so I make sure I'm answering it, not going off on a tangent? Yeah. Um, how is it realistic for us to even um, recommend that the legislature fund further studies into LSD, given that it seems like it's it, it is it prohibitively expensive to study? Like, is that something that we need to be aware of or is it just more more expensive to study or is it not more expensive to study at all and i'm 
I'm um, uh, completely wrong and, and would like to uh, would like to be corrected. So I saw Renji seem to really have a, his hand up for that. So would you like to go or would you like me to answer that? You're muted. Thank you. Uh, yes, Bennett, it, uh, you, you hit a, on two different points. Uh, I'll just be very careful in how I describe this. Both psilocybin and LSD are very similar molecules in what they're doing to the brain. They're binding to a very specific receptor, probably doing a lot more than just you know, binding to the serotonin 2A receptor. Really, the difference happens to be how sticky these molecules are to the receptor. LSD tends to be much stickier to the serotonin 2A receptor and tends to stay there for a longer period of time. So as you mentioned, it could be up to 12 hours, maybe even longer versus psilocybin, which could last for about maybe four or six hours. So to answer your question about research trials, and I know Jessica knows all about this as well, is if you're facilitating a trial with a patient and you have a facilitator, and usually in these clinical trials, you have to have two facilitators, it gets really expensive to pay facilitators or the clinical office space for an eight hour session for a full day of you know psilocybin versus starting at eight in the morning and then ending, let's say at eight at night, a 12 hour, maybe even later sort of session. So the answer is it's gonna be significantly more expensive to do these research trials. And in my opinion, um, we don't know it right now, but maybe there are other pot potential, very specific conditions like cluster headaches or uh, that might be useful for LSD, but uh, there are drawbacks to using LSD. And I think this is one of the reasons why people aren't sort of uh, looking into this. Dimethyltryptamine, on the other hand, very, very short half-life, but that's not what we're tasked to answer on uh, for the particular force. I'll end. All right, Margaret and then Michael. Uh, I think this is maybe a philosophical question. And Caroline, thank you so much for that very clear delivery. That was, that's really great. Um, I, I think I'm having a little bit of a concern because now we're we're deep in the research and now we're being asked to, well, what about the non-medical things? But we actually don't know. There is no equivalent of doing the deep dive of the research in non-medical um, environments or conditions. So I guess I'm just a little bit grappling with that. And I just wanted to say it out loud. That's it. All right. My, or actually, I just want to comment briefly, Margaret. I mean, I feel like with LSD, there's decades of use, you know, kind of in the general population showing that these are pretty safe. And there's um, this anecdote of a case report that was published from someone in Canada who did like accidentally snorted a line that they thought was cocaine. And it was crystal <laughs> version, like pure LSD. And it was like 500 times the dose. They were kind of incapacitated for a couple of days, but then I think they had bipolar disorder and then it was gone when they were done with the experience and they were physically safe. So it's, I think it's more of like a psychological risk, but I think physically, and there's tons and tons of evidence just from there, but it's not empirical as we would think about in trying to evaluate like scientific evidence, but it is out there. Michael? Yeah, so I know it's out there. It's just that we're not even looking at it here, right? We're just, that's sort of like on the wayside. That's all, but I appreciate that, Jessica. Thanks. And then- Yeah, that's, I was actually wondering about that if um, like uh, if there was an accidental ingestion or a like bad trip or whatever is there you know what what would be the protocol is there medication that you would you know give them or is it just if you know like if you can't talk them down or whatever i mean is that and would that be something that um yeah i, I guess i'm just here's i'm sure i could google it and figure it out but um while we're on the topic yeah, just real quickly, there is a rescue medication called catanserin that will abort the effect, um, and that's been published in the literature as well. All right, Helen and then Jeremy. Sorry, I should have had my microphone ready. Um, but I guess what I'm thinking is initially I, I selected yes and then more research. and then. Uh, but as I thought about it, what really was uh, in my mind was not so much the safety with regard to what was just discussed, but... Uh, Part of the presentation, they talked about uh, some of the effects uh, on high blood pressure and other kinds of things that uh, usually present or uh, in uh, populations that are uh, more marginalized. So I wonder about that if there's not. A, so I wonder about who's facilitating it, 
what's the environment uh, and, you know, how does it even get prescribed? Uh, because, uh, and then what are the safeguards around those kinds of things? Um, because my guess, and I, I don't know this, but my guess uh, is that uh, for many folks who've been doing this kind of on their own out in the community uh, and, and not sanctioned, uh, that um, it, it, we don't know because we don't know who they are and we don't know what's going on with them and if um, there have been some effect that has happened. So those are the things that I'm thinking about because if we want to, if it's going to be something that's going to be state sponsored, then um, what are the safeguards around what we already know are disparities when we see some indicators that some of these things might arise? Yeah, thanks for that comment, Helen. I do want to be mindful of time because we want to get to our next speaker um, real quickly. Um, Jeremy and then Adam, if you want to ask your question and then we can move on. Yeah, I'll be really brief. Uh, this is just a sort of general comment, but just something that um, as I think about this and, and as we have these conversations, I think in my mind, understanding um, how the meta how the substance will be administered is part of kind of, I think, the thinking that we should think about. So if it's LSD, if it's going to be in a in a therapeutic environment and be a tightly controlled environment, if it's ketamine, if it's going to be sort of like take home doses, um, you know, uh, if it's going to be, you know, sort of just adult regulated use in terms of anyone can go and, and purchase it if they're over 18 or 21 or whatever. I think just thinking through some of these substances, like how the how each of these substances is going to be available to individuals is a big part of kind of how I'm trying to sort through this. So just wanted to share that with the group and, and thank you for this good information and the presentation. Thanks, Jeremy. Adam? Yeah, I voted for yes to recommend LSD. And then I also voted in the medical box. My thinking is like, I recognize that the duration of the effect is much longer with LSD than psilocybin. And that ends up just costing more in staff time and office time. Uh, and I recognize more research needs to be done, but ultimately the role of this task force is not to you know, recommend a course of action for a specific patient. We're trying to give the legislature the information that they need to continue to do this work, to actually write the legislation. And ultimately any prescribing decisions would happen between the patient and their caregiver. So that's just kind of want to like remind everybody where we are right now. My vote generally is to keep all options as open as possible for as long as possible. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Caroline, did you have any closing thoughts or directives for folks before we move on to our guest speaker, Shane Pennington? No, not really. Um, I would suggest if you get a chance reading through that um, document, if you have any questions, please email me. There's probably some specifics I didn't include just to make sure it was you know, generally readable. But if you have questions, I'm really happy to answer them. Awesome. Thank you so much for that deep dive. That was really helpful. And thank you, everyone, for your engaging questions and comments and mural activity. All right. So we're going to move on now to our special guest, uh, Shane Pennington. Um, make sure my, yeah, my mic's off. Okay. Um, so Shane Pennington is a partner in, in the litigation department of Porter Wright Morris and Arthur LLP where he counsels clients on federal regulatory issues involving a number of industries, including energy, pharmaceuticals, controlled substances, aviation, and agriculture. A former law, a former law clerk to federal judges on the DC Circuit, the Fifth Circuit, and the DC District Court, Shane brings unique insight and strategic thinking to assist clients facing complex regulatory issues. Rated one to watch and a rising star in Appellate Law by the best lawyers in America, and super lawyers, respectively, Shane has argued cases in the UC, sorry, U.S. Courts of Appeals for the first, first, ninth, and D.C. circuits, securing landmark results for clients. He regularly litigates cases concerning federal and state agencies that involve the Administrative Procedure Act, the Controlled Substances Act, and the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Clients turn to Shane to advance their strategic goals within existing regulatory and legal frameworks, but also to develop creative strategies to reimagine those frameworks amidst rapidly changing industries. To that, aim, to that end, Shane often advocates for clients at the administrative level, working with state and federal regulators to devise novel solutions to seemingly intractable problems. He has represented companies, scientists, veterans, and industry coalitions before the Drug Enforcement Administration, the Department of Health and Human Services, the Food and Drug Administration, the Department of Justice, 
and the Security and Exchange Commission. So with that, I'll turn it over to Shane and thank you so much for um, joining us today and bringing your expertise to our task force. Thanks, thanks so much for having me. And uh, despite all of that very long bio, <clears throat> I am in my basement and it's very cold. So that's why uh, it looks this way. Uh, I work remotely from Beacon, New York, and um, we have another child on the way. So we're turning our whole house upside down and I don't have an office. So here I am. But uh, first thing I want to say is I just want to commend all of you for what you're doing. You know, I, I mainly focus on the, the federal area, but I keep a close eye on what's going on at the state level with various states because of the important implications uh, state laws and regulations and practices have on everything from just people's lives in the states that are regulated and then also on federal law and policy. And what Minnesota is doing and particularly what you guys are doing here is unique. You know, most states um, are just either, you know, sort of an on off switch for, for these issues. They either are just like, you know, drugs are bad. So we're not going to have any of that in our state or they sort of, you know, uh, pass a law that looks a lot like or they're looking at passing a law that looks a lot like, you know, Oregon, Colorado, some version thereof um, that is pretty, pretty open. And I think that what uh, y'all are doing uh, is very different and good in the sense that you're getting all these views and really trying to come to grips with this issue. And I think the more that you do that, the more you're going to see that it's actually a nest of issues. It's it's a lot of issues and a, and a lot of deep problems that no one's looking at carefully. And what makes you unique is that you are looking at them. And that the reason that we have all these issues and why it's such a puzzle is because you're so unique and you're the only ones actually looking at it in the way that you are. If everybody did this, right, then we wouldn't we wouldn't be in this situation. And so this brings me to kind of the first point that I want to make, which is why are we in this situation? I know you've already gone over uh, the history of the Controlled Substances Act and all that. But what I want to talk about is more just practical. The reason, one thing that may not have been highlighted or that may, I, I hope this will simplify to some extent, some of the many difficult uh, things that are swirling around here that make all of this confusing. That is that the way that we normally get drugs to people, right, is through doctors, but first they're approved by the Food and Drug Administration um, through these clinical trials, right? And those, as you probably have learned, are extremely expensive, costing, you know, a billion dollars to put a drug through generally at these days. And uh, the only folks paying for those clinical trials generally are the pharmaceutical companies. And they pay to put those drugs through because they get profit, you know, a promise of a, a great deal of profit if their drugs are approved because they get market exclusivity, meaning once that drug is approved by FDA, they're the only ones allowed to market it in interstate commerce. And you may have heard, you know, I know I'm, there are some folks who really know all of this on, on, the, on this call. So I'm, I know I'm oversimplifying to some extent, but please bear with me. You may have heard of like generics entering the market, right? Part of market exclusivity is that you get to, you get to be the only one out there and you get to block those generics from entering the market. Uh, generics being drugs that are just like yours, just not under your label, right? So it's the same molecule but it's not the one you're selling, right? So you get to block the competitors from entering the market for a period of time. How long that period of time is varies, but it's, you know, anything from a few years. If you have a lot of patents, it can be longer. Um, but, but the point for our purposes is that is so important to understand what's going on here because that market exclusivity is what allows the pharmaceutical companies to profit. And that profit is what incentivizes the research. And that research is what guarantees the health and safety, the efficacy, of these substances. And since that whole thing, what now that has all broken down <laughs> with these substances and it is broken down because the generics are already on the market. Okay. That is what you need to understand here. It doesn't matter if it's synthetic or if it's natural, it's already on the market. There's, al there's already high demand for these substances out there. And let me put a little finer point on it. We're talking about, well, what should we allow citizens to do? Should they be able to uh, access it in this way or that way? Those are obviously super important questions. And I, as I already have, I applaud you for looking into them and thinking about them as carefully as you are. But there's a sort of predicate question that I think 
we have to bear in mind or an issue that we have to keep in mind as we think about that, which is people are already accessing these substances. So, and I think everybody knows that, but it's easy to like let that slip from your mind as you think through all these issues. Cause it's like, well, would it be safe for us to do this? Would this be the right thing to do? And, you know, could we X, Y, or Z? And those are good questions to ask. And I'm not trying to diminish their importance, but it's equally important to know that whatever you do, there's already a market for these substances. They're already out there. And the reason that that's so important to understand and to keep in mind is because that market demand for the substances is part of what is going to make the research that you need to get done difficult to do. Because everybody wants randomized clinical trial research, the kind of research that gets FDA approval. That's what we keep hearing about it. And we want it peer reviewed and we want it published. And we sort of apologize when we look at data that doesn't meet that very high FDA standard. And the thing that, that, that is weird about that in this context is that people ha are already using it without that data and without knowing that. And they're going to continue to. And in fact, the, the, the usage rates are likely to increase, at least in the, in the short term, as more states, you know, yours or other ones, uh, change laws to loosen restrictions. And as breakthrough therapy, you know, status is given and then FDA approval will eventually be given to some of them, we presume. So we can expect that there will be uh, demand for the generic versions out there on the market regardless. And so as much as you want that clinical trial data so that doctors can know what to do, you know, with it and, and so that we can have just that sort of um, platinum level of research information to give to, uh, you know, lawmakers and, and the regulators who are going to be handling all of this, I think it, one thing that's, that we often overlook is how much we need to study what is in fact happening and what are the, what's the safety profile for people and how are they using these substances, in what context. And then, you know, what, what is the short-term and long-term consequence of using these substances in different ways by the people who are in fact using them? And to get that information is also extremely difficult, right? Because we're not used to researching things that way. It costs a great deal of money and so forth. And I just, I want to emphasize the importance of, of figuring those things out. And one thing that you're going to encounter when you start looking for, for that data, right? Be it the, the clinical trial data or the real world data that I was just talking about, right? Like what is happening out there on the ground? When you start to look for that and you start to come up with ways and ideas for how could we get our hands on that information because we want to help people keep them safe, uh, help them feel better, uh, have better lives, et cetera. We want them to have information, so forth. When you start to look for it, you're going to run into a big uh, problem, which is you're collecting data on people who are committing felonies under federal law. And so even if the federal government isn't enforcing that law at the moment, which, by the way, we don't really know exactly to what extent that is or is not true, because we kind of all, I think, have this idea that, well, they're not enforcing it with cannabis, so they will do the same for DMT, ayahuasca, LSD, you know, MDMA, Ibogaine, so forth. There's no guarantee there. There's no coal memo. There's no Rohrbach or FAR for these substances. So be very careful about, you know, your assumptions. And also those sorts of things can change from administration to administration. So, you know, we're in a, an election year and I think I don't need to tell everybody here what that means. So as we think about this and we're, we're thinking about collecting data, a puzzle arises. You need the data to drive policy. You need the data to keep people safe. You need the data to make prudent uh, assessments of anything that you're going to do. But as you collect the data, you're creating confidentiality and liability risks for the very people who you're trying to help. Okay? That's a puzzle. And it's a puzzle that if you look out there at the commentary and the sort of intelligentsia who talk about this, you'll see some folks tend to just ignore it. I think because either they have experience in the cannabis space, which they assume will will uh, carry over to these other substances. And I, I would not trust that. I can get into why, but I would not trust that that's so true. Or you have people who are very thoughtful about it who say, don't do it. Don't gather data. And generally, the, the 
the line that these people take on policy and regulation is more or less that they want just to wait for the federal government to fix all of this, right? Eventually in whatever way it decides to. And that neither one of those answers is satisfactory. And I think one of the key messages that I'd like to uh, get across today is that you should not accept either of those answers, at least not without uh, a lot of probing, right? I think that those are two, you shouldn't just accept that, well, we don't, you know, we can gather data, who cares? Like with cannabis, it'll all be all right. I would not trust that. I would, big yellow light there. And on the other hand, the, the idea that, well, it's too risky to gather data, therefore forget it. Just wait for the federal government to handle all this. That also, I think, is an irresponsible uh, answer. And so I wanna talk, the one, one thing that I really wanna get across uh, here is about how do we get that data? Because I, in my opinion, that is sort of the uh, daily bread of good policy. That You have to have that information if you're gonna answer these questions in a way that is responsible. And I see there's already a hand up, so I want to pause. Thanks so much, Shane. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, my name is Ari McHenry. I'm a drug policy and public health um, policy and researcher. And when you say that there's not data about people using LSD or that it's not available, people are already using it. I mean, there's so much been written over the last many years in drugs journals about the effects of LSD on health, right? So um, these people have been consented to research. I mean, it's not de-anonymized or anything, but there's plenty out there. Like you can do a search on Google Scholar for the health outcomes associated with LSD use. So maybe you'll cover this, but can you just clarify a little bit about what you mean about the data not being available? Sure. Yeah. So, so on the one hand, you're right. There's a lot of data. It depends on how you define data, right? Uh, there's a lot written about it. There's a lot of, um, we know a lot about, you know, how LSD or psilocybin or MDMA have been used, where they've been used, who's using them and, and so forth. But, you know, we've already heard, you know, I've been in and out of the, the meeting here uh, as things have happened at my house behind me. But I have I have been engaged enough to have already heard some folks saying, well, there's no data on cannabis use as medicine. Right. And yet it's, you know, out there on the market as medicine. It's been you know, there has this recognized medical use. And then others saying, well, there is, you know, quite a bit of data. And what these this back and forth confusion, I think, comes from is that when you talk to lawmakers, especially at the federal level, and when you talk to doctors, right, and you talk to um, scientists, they're looking for that, for that, you know, FDA clinical trial data, right? And there's no like, gold standard for real world evidence out there that's the equivalent. But we know that HHS just looked at state level medical use to decide that cannabis had a currently accepted medical use and treatment in the United States just a couple months ago in a very official, very, very long winded uh, analysis. So there's a question here about what is data and what is the acceptable data to make policy decisions. So you can have a lot of data like I could I could have a ton of data about what, you know, kids my daughter's age think about LSD. Right. And you could have a lot of that and it would be useless information. It'd be data, but it'd be useless. So on the one hand, what we need, I think, is the type of data that will drive policy and not just to you and I, like what we would think would, but to a broader audience, you know, and the reason we need to decide on what that is and get that is because we need to be able to compare across state lines, talk with the federal government about this. You know, there was a mention of, OK, well, what about what's going on in other countries? Right. Well, without some idea of what we're looking for, i.e., what is the data that we're looking for and what would it entail? It's hard to really have these conversations because it's like you're looking every it's like the blind men, just, you know, looking at an elephant. And one of them's describing the tail and one's describing the trunk with all this different types of data. What I'm saying is we need the data. We need a we need two types of data. We need clinical trial data. The, the, the type that you get for, for drug approval and medical contexts. But then we also need to develop, first of all, document and decide what is the important data for what's actually happening in the real world with these substances. And what I would suggest as a starting point for what should count there is something along the lines of what HHS looked at to decide that cannabis had a currently accepted medical use. And what did they look at? Well, 
they looked at are licensed healthcare professionals recommending and using this substance in treatment with their patients. And at a certain point, they said, that amount of widespread acceptance and use starts to matter at the federal level because states like Minnesota get to decide for themselves what is acceptable medical practice in Minnesota, okay? And not the FDA. The FDA can say whether a drug is safe and effective for interstate marketing, but that's not to say that those are the only substances that have medical utility. The states have a lot of say over that, that question. And so I, would, I think that you should, you know, whether you're talking about um, adult use, medical use, whatever, a big component of what I think you should be looking for and figuring out how to get is the medical use at, at the state level, whether it's federally legal or not, okay? Because we know that that data matters for driving not just your state policy, but also federal policy. That's going to be data that you can, that, you know, other states will be interested in. And you, you would like to know, I presume, what's happening in other states with their medical programs. It's something that we already have an infrastructure built around that we can start to learn from each other and start to develop policy that way. And I'm not saying that, that to exclude other sources of important information, right? There are many. I'm not even in a position to tell you what you should do with the universe of information that's out there. What I am saying is that kernel is extremely important right now because we know that it will drive policy and we know that it will be sort of fungible from state to state. You know, it's a sort of a baseline. I see uh, another hand up. Yeah, thanks, Shane. Uh, also, thanks for the great... Um... Uh, the great uh, newsletter that you put together. First, so first time, long time, I should say. Um, as you're describing this collection of data, I just want to clarify, are you describing it within the context of the current state of unregulated, quote unquote, street use? Um, or are you describing data collection within the context of what could be something akin to like... Um, in Oregon or Colorado, quasi-medical, um, quasi-recreational use. Which of those two situations are you describing the the need for data collection in, or both? So I think I mean, I think you need data across the board, right? I think you need to if you're going to be looking into the prudent way to regulate something that people are already using, I think you should know how people are already using, using it and then what that's doing to them, right? Um, that would be something I would want to know. So that's your illicit use channel. And by the way, all of this use is illicit. Let's be clear, like all of it. So you're not studying any illicit use. You're, you're studying illicit use across the board. However, I understand that, you know, we have to prioritize what data we gather, what, you know, where we put our resources. And if you had to put them in one place right now, I think the most important place is in um, how they're being used by doctors in medical treatment, right? So if you set up a program where doctors could recommend, say, psilocybin to a patient in treatment in Minnesota, and you, then if there were a way to gather data about that that didn't create a liability risk for everybody involved, right, and that respected the confidentiality rights of those folks and that could drive policy for the state and the federal government, because we now know that that sort of data is extremely important for, for example, rescheduling. HHS has told us that. That would be a golden opportunity to get the most bang for your buck in terms of state resources. That's sort of my thesis. That's not, now, if you have infinite funds, then yes, you would want to know everything about what's going on. But I, what I'm, my thesis is, is that it's starting with a medical lane, a therapeutic lane that's overseen by the infrastructure that you already have in place in Minnesota, right? Through healthcare professionals and providers that you already license and regulate. Using this uh, in treatment with patients, and then tracking that data over short and long term. That is, to me, today for states, the gold standard, because that data can then drive rescheduling, which will remove 280E, right, from the mix. And if, you know, everybody, I don't know, I assume everybody knows what that is, but 280E is the 
gigantic federal tax penalty that's going to prevent you from having a profitable industry in any of this anytime soon until this stuff is out of Schedule 1 or Schedule 2 of the Federal Controlled Substances Act. Um, so gathering that data, driving that policy change is, I think, actually, you know, the, the most important thing that you could be doing right now. Uh, I see a, another hand. Yeah, Shane, this is Renji Verghese. I really appreciate this conversation. I hear you saying there's a short game and a long game here. In the in let's let's use we just we dealt we at least right now we have zero data that we can use any of these substances in clinical use because they're schedule one. Right. Marijuana, a little bit different, just because you have a synthetic form, dronabinol, who's which has been used for years and decades. Mm -hmm. We do have some of that data. So and we can use that to say, hey, listen, this is safe. We we've used this in 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 other folks. We just are not able to do that right now with psilocybin, LSD, MDMA so far. But now, now this is sort of the long game that I hear you saying. If we were to sort of open this up, would there be a data repository for individuals? And it's just a thought of mine. Sure. Well, you're inspiring this, essentially, is if we were able to create a repository of people that did re receive these sort of medicines, and that's tricky, obviously, but if they were protected and they were anim in that anonymized, yep. um, to then have that data, to be able to use that particular data as we move forward. So more of a comment and a thought than uh, no. anything. Yeah, yeah. No, that's exactly, that's exactly what I'm saying. And I think that there are other important, I think you raise an important contrast between the cannabis situation. I mean, it was the 80s when you had Dronabinol, Sativex, make it all the way through the FDA process, right? But we're about to get there. We're on the precipice. And that's what, that's why it's such a historic point in time that this conversation is arising at the state level, right? Because you're about to have MDMA presumably uh, approved. Now, it'll be a formulation of it, presumably Lycos's formulation. But there's also, like I said, sort of the generic that's out there on the market that's being used. And so now would be the time. Why did it take? decades for cannabis for hhs to realize that cannabis had currently accepted medical use based on treatment in the states because we weren't gathering the data what did they have to do in order to approve to to recognize that they had to go to the states and ask them pretty please for the data right wouldn't it have been safer and better for everybody to know i don't know 30 years ago uh what the implications were and i guess i would say i'm not a doctor i mean you are i'm not but i would my sense is that we should definitely know that stuff about psychedelics because it's the the sort of profile of what these do to people in their uh in the across different you know people with different uh walks of life and different i guess comorbidities maybe is the term that you use um is going to be more dramatic i suspect and now there are there are a lot of hands so i'll pause there uh should i, I guess adam is yeah, the first myself Paula and then ari Thanks so much, Shane, for being here. I really appreciate it. Uh, my question will be, I, I understand what you're saying about going through the established standard medical process for like synthetic MDMA, synthetic LSD, synthetic psilocybin. What are your thoughts on, as a completely separate thing, adult regulated use of naturally grown psilocybin containing mushrooms or truffles that can be regulated in terms of the strain, the percentage of psilocybin by weight, uh, the packaging and sold to adults age 21 and over without at all wrapping it up into the greater medical regulatory world. What are, what are your thoughts on, on that? So I guess it's such a complicated, it's such a complicated question to try to answer quickly and I don't want to yeah. ramble. Sure. So it's important to understand that the adult use, whatever we might think about it as a policy matter, is not going to drive federal reform at all. And as long as you have federal prohibition, you're going to have these tax problems and these banking problems and these other problems that I'm telling you. And mark my words, go watch what happens in Colorado and Oregon, okay? You yeah. could look now or you can look in two years. As long as 280E is in place, you are not going to have a sustainable industry in any of this, okay? So what you're actually going to have is um, 
a giant liability risk in a, a wedge between federal and state policy that's going to make it harder and harder to reform federal law as time goes on. And this is what you've seen with cannabis. And it will be as bad or worse, I believe, for psychedelics and for a number of reasons that I could get into. So that's that's why I focus on the the medical model so much. That's why I'm focused there. Um, I guess that what I would say now, personally, I'm a libertarian, like shocker, right? So if I had it my way, you know, we would reconstruct this entire thing in a totally different way. But we're not, it's so far afield from anything that's realistic. And, and it's out of our hands as a, even if, even if we could control the entire Minnesota law, for example, right? It still couldn't, you, the, the, the edifice that it's sitting on is so broken at the federal level that it's kind of premature or futile to even talk in those terms. But I just want to answer your question directly. Like, I'm for it. I, I think you should. I think people are using these things and you'd be a lot better off regulating it than pretending that we're going to enforce these laws that nobody's enforcing criminally. Um, but I'll have to stop there for now. So I, there's a another thank one. You. Yeah, thank you. Is it Paula DeSanto? Yep, thanks. Um, I guess I just want to say, it sounds like you're kind of a fan of what's going on in Utah in terms of, the, the priority to, you know, uh, drive a federal reform. And I, and I appreciate that perspective. I'm not quite sure that that's our, our primary objective, but I, I get, I, I appreciate the, the connections that you're drawing. We've also been advised by other legal experts that, you know, there's some really strong recommendations to stay out of the medical model with this, with this, this work. And if we really want to kind of keep um, the feds off our back and do what we need to do that best represents the the, the the needs or the, or the wants or the priorities of Minnesota. So just my two cents there. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to, I wish that those, those other experts were on. And in fact, I, I listened, uh, I've gone and listened to the other uh, meetings, I guess, you know, cause you post them publicly, which again, uh, kudos to all of you for doing that. And I reached out and tried to contact uh, the folks who you're talking about um, and they wouldn't engage with me. Uh, I think it's because they're scared and they know that my my views would be so overwhelmingly uh, persuasive uh, that they wouldn't be able to to handle them. And so they just declined to comment. I actually don't know why they don't want to talk to me. But what I'll tell you is I'm working right now with the FDA. OK, I'm working with HHS at the federal level. This is like my area uh, for sure. And I'm I'm also working with former the former head of the controlled substances staff at FDA, who's a partner at Arnold and Porter named Howard Sklamberg, who, it, you know, worked directly under Janet Woodcock for years, who's the head of CEDAR for years and years, although she's gone now, but she basically made the law the way it is that we, you know, know today in FDA in this area. These are the people who, you know, even if you don't trust me, these are the people I'm working with, right? And so with that, I, I will say I'm, I'm very confident. I would like to have that conversation about whether we should be worried about FDA jumping in, um, what I will say is at a at first, FDA's jurisdiction is based on interstate commerce. And so the more careful you are about keeping whatever you establish intrastate, the less likely you are to court disaster from the FDA. And to the extent that you're worried about federal involvement, I just don't understand why setting up an adult use regime that blatantly violates federal law and has no conceivable way of ever getting back in line with federal law. I mean, there is a DEA and there is a Department of Justice and they are much more like enforcement minded and in, they have a history of enforcement that goes is far scarier. And if they would, I mean, if it just does, it boggles my mind that we would think that the, the FDA is the one that you have to worry about. I mean, it's, it's the DEA and DOJ. Uh, it's not like you're avoiding the conflict with federal law by, you know, avoiding the medical lane. It's it's present. It's there no matter what you do. Um, and the last thing I, I see there are other hands. I just want to get I want to answer this at the surface level, at least, because it's so important. Um, what you're doing is affecting federal law. You can't avoid that. I understand your charge. And so I will you know, I understand that we all have to accept that. But th since I'm not part of the I'm just here telling you what I believe, uh, not not uh, beholden to those assumptions, I'm going to tell you the truth, which is that what you're doing is going to influence federal law. 
The question is how. And what you're going to do is you're going to create a, a set of incentives that are either going to incentivize, you know, more or less federal crime, more or less safe for risky behavior, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So those realities are the ones that I would, you know, I understand you got to operate the way that you do. And, and it's a very fair point in the in the under the circumstances. Um, but it's a frustrating one for me because like we're literally in a we're literally sitting at a point in time where state policy is manifestly influencing federal law, right? And we've seen the cannabis example, we can learn from it or not. And that's, you know, I think that that's at least a surface level answer. Okay, there's uh, another one, Ari. Thanks, Shane. Yeah, no, I appreciate your I appreciate your point of view. And I think that the idea that the DEA and ONDCP like look at evidence when they're making policy is a little bit laughable. Like they, it's a political question for them from top to bottom. Maybe recently they've started to look at the evidence, but I think that the, like the clarity that they've had about cannabis, you know, the harms that it's caused as a, you know, like to, to, to people's health, like they've known for ages that it hasn't been a health harm. They've just been interested in, in carrying out this like really punitive approach, you know? So I, my sense and the, the advice that I've gotten from others, which I think people that I trust and make sense to me. And like you say, big caveat on what happens in November, but I don't think that the government is interested in cracking down on these things anymore. I think that it's a much different game than it was 30 years ago with cannabis. I think the war on drugs as we know it is kind of, it's concluding. They don't have as many, they don't have the interest in cracking down on folks as much as they used to. I think we see that with safe consumption sites. I think we see that with Oregon and Colorado. I think they would have cracked down if they wanted to. Um, so I guess I just, I, I do kind of fundamentally disagree with your take. I do agree that like what we're going to do is going to influence federal policy. And my understanding is like the more that we can push at the state level, I think the feds like want my, t my take. And I mean, I, I am not in the room the way that you do or the, the way that you are, but I see the feds like looking to the states to push them to do more that perhaps that they are interested in a different approach. Um, I think, I think that's clear in the federal drug control strategy that they're like wanting to pursue like a kinder, a kinder, gentler war on drugs, if you will. Um, and I just don't see them as interested in cracking down as they used to be. And I'm talking about the DEA here, not the FDA. Um, so yeah, evidence, I don't think it matters to them. I think it's a political question, you know? Thank you. Um, I, I, hold yeah. on. I just want to chime in real quick because we're getting close to our end point. We have four minutes left until our hard stop. Um, so I just want to be mindful of that. And I do want to get to uh, Kit's question. So Shane, if you yeah. want to respond. Kit. Kit, and then I'll look, all right, that was, you know, fundamentally disagreeing with my position. I obviously have something to say, but I want to hear Kit's question first. You're muted. Okay. I guess it jumps off of Ari's um, pretty well here, but my question is, um, if we know that the DEA still doesn't really want to look at evidence, they've threatened pharmacies for trying to dispense um, medical marijuana in states where it is legal, um, threatened with taking away their licenses and paying for federally funded healthcare reimbursement, that if we try to push um, psychedelics through the medical model, <clears throat> wouldn't anybody in the medical system be at risk of receiving the same treatment from the DEA in order to get that evidence that the federal government wants? Sure. So great question. So first of all, to Ari's point, and I'm obviously, I got three minutes, so um, this is going to be very fast, but Ari, I am not saying that DEA, DOJ, ONDCP are evidence loving, evidence following agencies. Okay. What they are, though, they, they are bound by law to a certain extent, meaning that as long as something is federally criminally prohibited at, under federal law, they literally cannot sanction it. So, whatever else they might do, they're not going to sanction it. And so I don't think you, that's not our fundamental disagreement. If we have a fundamental disagreement, it would be whether FDA is chomping at the bit to go enforce, again, you know, 
against what? Unless unless Minnesota is is planning on marketing psychedelics in interstate commerce, um, I'm not sure exactly what the concern is about FDA. If your concern now, Kit added on to this, which is, uh, well, what I'm concerned about is the the licensed healthcare providers in Minnesota who you're encouraging to, you know, entertain the prospect of recommending these things in treatment, right? And that would risk their licenses. Yes, but with whom, right? With the DEA, the one who everybody's saying doesn't care and isn't going to enforce. But let's pretend now that they are suddenly going to do that, right? That next weekend, they decide just like they did in Georgia, right, with the pharmacies. That was because those folks attempted to dispense those substances to people through the pharmaceutical model. That violated their registration. Notice that doctors who are recommending cannabis to patients are not arrested, not their licenses aren't suspended and so forth. My presumption is the future will be like the past and that they would do the same thing with psychedelics in that regard, right? And if you don't believe me, even better, because the idea that I would really like to sell to you is that you should avoid all of this and you should start gathering the data through a research program of the attorney general that would literally waive the liability and the uh, the confidentiality problems at the at the outset. That's what 21 USC 872 E does. That's why I'm such a big fan of it. And if you want, the last thing I want to say, because I know we're at time, is if you want an example historically of this, you should look at methadone clinics. This is how they came to be. This is how they were. They started at the state level. It became legalized at the federal level, and eventually federal law changed that way. And so that's kind of the my soapbox there. And I appreciate everybody's questions. I'd be happy to talk longer or talk to any of you offline. Yeah, thank you so, so much, Shane. That was very, very helpful. I appreciate you coming on and giving us your expertise and impassioned perspective on all of this and everyone else for all your questions. We are out of time, so I think Jess has the... Um, closing remarks on, you know, I just want to thank everyone and all the listeners for joining and um, there is opportunity for member feedback. So leave all of your feedback on the mural. Um, if you have any questions between meetings, you can contact Jess Burke at jessica.burke at state.mn.us. And our next meeting for the full task force will be on Monday, May 6th from 930 to 1230 p.m. Thank you everyone for listening, joining, engaging, and we'll see you next month. Bye.